me see. Hello, hello. Hello. It's on. So welcome back, everybody, and good morning. Eva Krutmeier here again. Uh, some of us missed yesterday. I hope uh, you can... I mean, why don't you all call your friends to come here? I think it's a little bit embarrassing with so many empty seats when we have some fantastic speakers today. What do you say, Mats? Yeah. Yes, yes. Actually, yesterday we were discussing the infrastructures and the facilities and innovation and all this from many different perspectives. But uh, let's today focus on uh, society and infrastructures in society and what's good for society and trying to close the loop. Uh, how can those facilities actually pay back to members of the society? And um, but the first speaker, he's not only the funding member of uh, Euroscience, where he's now the general secretary, he uh, was also, as we heard yesterday, uh, one of the key persons uh, at ESS and uh, chaired, uh, the ESS from, chaired the ESS from 2007 onwards. So it's a fantastic pleasure and an honor to welcome uh, no less than Peter Tindemans. Give him a big hand. And when we were discussing his talk earlier, uh, you can be sure that we will, we will not only uh, receive a, a sort of history lesson, but we will also learn from history now. So what are the key success factors if we look back? And what can we take from that from, from now and to the future? Because we are already in the future, we learned yesterday, aren't sure. we? So please, Peter. All right. Everything works here? Does it work? Can we hear you? It yes, I think it we works. Okay, I think okay. we do. Yeah, and that works. All right. So, thank, um, you. thank you very much and uh, welcome, all of you. Um, what I thought I should do is indeed give you a, a brief history. It's, of course, a subjective history of research infrastructures as we reconstruct that history now from what we know about these infrastructures in the past uh, several decades. Um, and I will indeed try and identify uh, factors which, in my view, have been important for determining the success of these infrastructures. But secondly, and that's why I start out with something which you might not have expected, um, infrastructures are increasingly, that's what we know, relevant for all fields of science. And they have been in the past, actually. And so that's why I would start with the Alexandria Library. Uh, so I have made five distinctions, five different stages in the history of research infrastructures. Um, the Library of Alexandria, which was fa a fairly unique phenomenon, actually, uh, also in the past. Then we have, we go move rapidly forward to this century, the last century, the prehistory, uh, until, I would say, a decisive uh, movement, the first cyclotrons, which uh, Ernest Lawrence developed in the United States, we have the ongoing history, because it is still ongoing, with the, back, the big facilities like the European Spallation Source and Max 4 here in Lund. Um, but we have entered the new age with distributed infrastructures. And I'll give some examples of them um, and explain why this is indeed a new age of which we don't know yet all characteristics. And finally, uh, there is again a new stage, which is the European Open Science Cloud. So, um, we'll start first with the, uh, the ancient library of Alexandria. That was really a center of scholarship. It was established in the middle of the 3rd century BCE. Uh, it burned down in, I believe, um, exactly 400 CE. Um, but during that period, it was really a center of scholarship. Um, it was um, a place where uh, scientists from various fields worked, astronomy, mathematics, history, um, all sorts of literati and humanity scientists. Um, they all came to that place, and that was indeed unique, because there were many collections, of course, of all sorts of uh, written things in uh, those times, but most of them were archives, and they were not these public places of scholarship. 
Um, and so um, in, the, in, in 2002, actually, um, a new uh, Bibliotheca Alexandrina was born. Uh, it was reborn, um, made by Ismail Semageldin, and I'll come to him later on, uh, because um, he has built up again this place of scholarship uh, for all fields of science, um, and the sad history, he is now retired, he's emeritus, uh, the sad history is that um, as of 2012, I believe, there have been brought a lot of sentences against him, um, and he recently has been sentenced um, um, in Egypt, and I think he deserves our support, because those sentences, those, those accusations are just simple nonsense. And so, um, it is a reminder that uh, this is not something which is outside of all sorts of political movements. Let's move on to the, the second stage. I would characterize that second stage in the first place by individual achievements. Um, individuals uh, try to develop infrastructures, as we would call them now, uh, for a broader use uh, for science. And some trace the beginning to James Cook. James Cook, and here is his ship, the Endeavour, uh, he went on an expedition to the Pacific uh, to observe the transit of Venus across the Sun in 6, 1769. That was on the request of, after a request from the Royal Society, uh, they uh, petitioned King George III in, the, in England uh, to finance such an exhibition, and the Admiralty uh, made it possible, uh, and um, on the going discovered Australia. Um, so that was um, in the 18th century, uh, but of course we all know much more, we associate much more the history of research infrastructures with the fields of, of astronomy, the telescopes, uh, particle accelerators, but actually you have already to go to the, to the 20th century uh, to see that those things emerge. There have been, of course, uh, telescopes in use since the uh, 17th century, but those were simple telescopes for individuals and not for broader use. Universities started to build their observatories in the 19th century, uh, but only in the um, 1910s, actually, one saw them becoming bigger, and the first really big one, the Hale Telescope at Mount Palomar in the US, uh, was constructed during the time of the Second World War and began, became operational in 1949. And the particle accelerators, following uh, the development of physics in the, in the 20th century, um, they started off as of the 1930s. Um, the Van der Graaff generator was the first one, Cockroft Walton. But then came Lawrence. Lawrence uh, was convinced that um, the Cockroft Walton type of accelerator or the Van der Graaff generator uh, couldn't deliver because simply of the size. And so he thought, he, he, discovered, he didn't discover it himself, but he read an article about someone who said, well, if you uh, try to uh, make uh, electrons rotate, uh, and you can do that via a magnetic field, then you can build much and much smaller devices to accelerate particles. And that's what he did, and in a rapid sequence of ever larger cyclotrons, he became actually the father of big science. But just to show how small these things were, here is a picture of one of the first cyclotrons he developed. And it's just the size of your hand. It's very, very minute indeed, but they became bigger and bigger in five, six years' time. But I think one should not forget, in talking about the history, also uh, things like wind tunnels. Wind tunnels are an old phenomenon. They started to be constructed, um, apparently in 1871, uh, just to study uh, the, the lift and drag um, effects on bodies moving through air. And of course, that is essential for aircraft, etc. They're still in use. Uh, they are huge pieces of equipment. And you have oceanographic vessels. James Cook's vessel was not an oceanographic vessel. Oceanographic vessel. It was to study astronomical phenomena. Uh, but we have developed uh, huge um, oceanographic vessels um, in the decades since uh, the first part of the, 19th, of the 20th century. Now, um, what would you describe as determinants for the success? Um, I think uh, key factors were, of course, in the first place, the genius and the drive of individuals. 
and not unimportantly uh, their ability to find resources. And that's why uh, Lawrence especially has become the father of big science. He has been able to tap especially the Rockefeller Foundation for increasingly large amounts of money to fund his ever larger pieces of equipment. Technical skills were important, um, but I think also um, uh, this was possible because the scale of these uh, parentheses in those times, uh, they were still feasible for ordinary institutions such as universities. Um, and also in the more applied field for institutions which were often part of the military um, and that was in the country, uh, wind tunnels were, were a case in point. Um, so those were the important points I think uh, for the um, research facilities in those times. Now after World War II, the, the scene all uh, changed completely. Um, that was partly due to the efforts to develop the atomic bomb, but also more generally, uh, we entered into a new phase. Um, uh, we got particle accelerators, there were atomic reactors for uh, research with neutrons, the telescopes got bigger and bigger, uh, accelerators for synchrotron radiation came up, uh, the space satellites as of the end of the 1950s, uh, thermonuclear fusion devices uh, became ever bigger since the 50s and 60s. Um, and we also got, of course, dedicated organizations. Uh, we heard yesterday about... Um, uh, the, about um, now, let's... <laughs> Sorry? Oh, I'm stuck. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, we have the national laboratories more generally in, um, in the US. Uh, we have national laboratories in Europe. Um, we have the big international ones in Europe, CERN, the European Space Agency, uh, the European Southern Observatory. Uh, we have uh, university consortia to operate large telescopes, country consortia to do the same. Um, and what has been always a characteristic of science, that is, the history of science has always been also a history of scientific instruments, became ever more true uh, for big science. Um, big science uh, inevitably requires um, uh, more energy, better resolution, faster detection, um, and that led continually to ever more breakthroughs. And there was a famous sentence um, due to Casimir. Casimir was a famous physicist, but he was also uh, the vice president of Philips, the company Philips uh, for research. And he has written much about science and the development of science. And he always spoke about the upward science technology spiral. And that shows the interaction between science and instruments and technology. And the story, of course, will continue. Uh, we have seen the first um, effects of, the, uh, of LIGO, the gravitational wave detector. Um, uh, even, even this week, again, there was more news uh, from uh, gravitational waves. We will have the square kilometer array with a, a part being built in South Africa uh, and another part being built in Australia. Um, and so that shows that we have not seen the end of um, big science. And the question now is, um, have they delivered? Um, and I think we should say simply yes, very largely yes. Um, we have seen time and cost overruns, and we will see those in the future. And it's very difficult, of course, to make an assessment of whether the science results um, were worth the effort which has been spent on that. That's a question which I, think, I don't think we can answer. But in terms of the science, they have delivered. Um, there have been, of course, also um, not very many and maybe only one spectacular failure. Uh, the superconducting supercollider was mentioned yesterday already. It was cancelled after years of problems and after two billion investment in the soil in Texas. Um, and there were many reasons for that. Um, no one perhaps decides if there were cost overruns. Uh, people say sometimes it was too big a step forward and the decision had been taken too quickly. Uh, there were certainly management problems. Uh, there was resistance in the larger physics community. Um, and so that resulted in the end in the cancellation of the uh, construction of the superconducting supercollider. But it led again uh, also at the policy level to an important development. It was a key factor in establishing the OECD megasite Forum in 92, which I've chaired until 99, uh, which is now the OECD Global Science Forum. And to my surprise, my recent surprise, no, the PIC reactor, the neutron reactor in Russia, um, is not one of these failures. I thought always it would be one of these failures. Um, it was 
the construction started in 1976. That's a huge time ago. Um, and when I was responsible for ESS and for the OECD Mega Science Forum, everyone spoke about the PICA reactor as a thing of the past. It would never be finished. And to my surprise, when I just started looking around for information, I found out that the Russian government actually had decided in, in 2007 to continue construction again. And it's almost finished. And it will be operational in 2018-2019. And this is a huge reactor, 100 megawatts. Just to compare, um, the biggest one we now have, the ILL in Grenoble, has 60 megawatts. So this is a very big, very big reactor. <coughs> Here is our, our two pictures of the superconducting supercollider. Um, on the right-hand side, you see... Uh, can I... On the right-hand side, you see the, uh, the tunnel um, and one shaft upwards. And on the left-hand side, you see these huge buildings um, on the soil in Texas. So, um, once you'd ask now, when I'm saying these have delivered, um, I think there are uh, good reasons why these have delivered and will deliver in the future, like LIGO is doing and like certainly the Square Kilometer Way will do as well. And the key reason has to do with something which Helga Novotny talked about uh, a month ago in Budapest, the resilience of science. And I would concentrate on the resilience of the scientific, on the, of the organizational side um, of the scientific endeavor, uh, and not only on the scientific process itself. Um, there is a strong organization in various fields of science at the continental or even the global level. Um, and that means there are structures for consultation, for foresight, uh, for consensus building. Sometimes this happens in disciplines. Um, uh, some astronomy is an example, particle physics is a good example. Sometimes it happens around tools which are being used for several disciplines, uh, synchrotron radiation, neutron radiation, there are committees uh, who deliver these structures, um, the committees on future accelerators, for example. Um, you have, of course, major uh, laboratories which play a key role in these uh, structures in science. Um, there are sometimes um, national efforts. In the U.S., for example, you have the science decadal reviews of the National Academies of Science, which play an important role. And they all contribute to establishing consensus in the end about uh, the important issues in science, uh, where science is heading uh, for, and what facilities are needed. And so uh, that means uh, priority setting in the first place. There is long-term planning which ensues from that. There is a step-by-step decision-making. One establishes a science case, uh, one goes to the technology case, one establishes a financial case, um, and the consequence is that there is increasing maturity and increasing confidence among the scientists, uh, but also among politicians and funding agencies who support that. And the consequence is that, in fact, nobody doubts that new facilities such as the European Spallation Source here in Lund um, or the Square Kilometer Array will be a success. Uh, there has been so much effort going on, there is so much consensus building, a part of the history of uh, the establishment of these facilities, that this is bound to be a success. And that's why I'm saying you can't really say there is a failure, because these SSC in the US was a failure, but not because it would not have demonstrated its scientific value. That's most likely what it would have done. So that's an important lesson. And uh, just as an example, um, uh, in the US, of course, the situation is different from the situation in Europe. And I'm mentioning here an, an exercise which was very interesting in 2002, uh, the Department of Energy's 20-year uh, outlook for large facilities. And uh, it, happens, um, in a fo it happened in the following way. Um, the national labs and key institutions in the US were invited by DOE to submit proposals for new facilities for the next 20 years. And the point is that the DOE in the US is responsible for most of the uh, big facilities, big investments in natural sciences, um, even to some extent in life sciences, with the exception of astronomy. So they could do that. There was a tight fitting by various experts on panels, um, and that resulted in the end in a proposal by the director of the Office for Science of DOE uh, to, uh, to Congress in the end for um, a series of priority 
installations, priority investments for the short term, for the midterm, and for the long term. Um, and this was based on an assumption that the annual budget would grow with a certain percentage. But um, the point is, and here is um, um, the example, here is the list which they came up with. You can't read this. Uh, the red ones are the short-term priorities, the blue ones um, are the mid-term, and the green ones the long-term. And they are shown here with uh, the blackest spots indicating where the peak funding would have to, uh, to come. Um, and this sort of Priority setting exercise is key to the success of the large facilities. In Europe, the process is much more diffuse, but still, in the end, the arguments are basically the same. And this was actually um, the, the starting point for the roadmap of the S3 forum in the European Union. Now, let me quickly also say something about stage four and then later stage five. We have seen um, since the 90s the concept of distributed infrastructures for various fields of science. And the very early example was the European Social Survey, uh, where um, a number of institutes and social scientists from various countries collaborated uh, to make possible comparative studies of various surveys in economics, in history, in sociology, in politicology. Um, and that has been uh, developed into what is now the European Social Survey, uh, which is a big support for social sciences. LifeWatch is another example where a collaboration has been set up between biodiversity centers in various countries in Europe uh, to make possible a much more um, coherent approach towards the study of biodiversity resources. Um, uh, I want to mention two other ones. Uh, Biobanks and biomolecular resources is a very good example, I think, uh, where institutes who collect data um, um, on uh, human life, um, tissues, for example, but also um, other resources. Um, and the idea is always in these distributed resources to make resources available to the wide community to develop search opportunities, to enhance quality, uh, to move on for, with standardization, uh, to provide in certain areas um, what is called now in jargon the LZ services, ethical, legal and social impact, uh, uh, to just learn from each other on how this should be done in the correct way. Uh, there is always training. Um, and um, another one is, um, oh, I've marked it wrongly, it's Elixir. Um, and it's just, and that's all data for life sciences. Um, the key note is actually the um, European uh, Bioinformatics Institute in Cambridge, part of the EMBL. Uh, but it's now just one of the notes, but it's the most important one, I would say. And again, it's upon it's upon making it's it's all making available data. Uh, it's in this case also database tools, computing services, etc. Uh, and so these are important things. And the, here is the the hub in Cambridge, um, and you can't see, of course, very much. It's just an office building, uh, and that's it. Uh, in contrast to the large telescopes, for example. And now um, I would say we cannot yet speak of determinants for success. Uh, because that's too early. But we can speak f um, about certain challenges. Um, we, in the first place, need those infrastructures. Um, there is no doubt about that, that many fields of science, the life sciences, uh, the health sciences, social sciences, uh, biodiversity, environmental sciences, they need these infrastructures. But we still have to learn and are learning how we should set up these infrastructures. Because there are challenges. A minor one, uh, but not unimportant, I think, is the name. Um, if you speak about CERN, about ESA, about ESO, you know what that means. But you won't know what BBRMI is. You won't know what Elixir is. Uh, so it's a challenge, I think, because it speaks to, the, um, to, the, uh, to, to people if you can associate the name with what it actually is. More importantly, of course, is that the, the support for these facilities is decentralized. Political support is decentralized, financial support is decentralized, and that makes life very difficult. If you don't have a strong central funding mechanism, for example, it's going to be not easy. There is often an almost unlimited number of partners uh, without a strong central organization. 
Um, and it's more difficult uh, to find strong leaders, uh, strong management in these environments. Much more difficult than in the large concentrated physical facilities. And the last question which I think we should all think about is, how can you create this, what I call, organizational resilience? Um, and I think um, one would be wise to think about a certain number of things. For example, I would always uh, hesitate to increase continuously the number of partners. Start with a number of a limited number of key players and build your infrastructure around those uh, key players. Uh, start from real resources and not just from ideas. I've seen in the first phases of the S3 roadmap that there were lots of ideas of these sort of facilities which were not really based on getting real resources together in a form to make them accessible. And then the final one um, is now inevitable, the European Open Science Cloud. And I mention it because it is crucial indeed, but we have to be very, very careful. The initial idea uh, was, um, it, it's about data, let me first say that. Uh, it's about making available the data which are being collected in all sorts of research. And the first idea was, for me at least, completely frightening. It was again this idea of create a central European facility uh, with the obligation to ingest all your data, starting with the Horizon 2020 data, etc. And this is frightening because it is totally at odds with what is happening in the science communities. The particle physicists have developed their own cloud. The astronomers have done so. In social sciences, uh, one is increasingly doing the same. And they all follow somewhat different formats. And that's no problem. The Internet has learned us how we should do those things. Um, and so the idea to create a central facility is just ridiculous. Uh, but luckily, um, there was an EC high-level expert group led by Baron Mons, uh, who late 2016 pointed out uh, how this could be done in the way the Internet has developed. Um, Self-organization is the key word. And so, um, uh, these are a couple of uh, main points, uh, which they, you, you can't read them, but I've, I'll just mention a few ones. The first one is, you have to think about automation. Uh, machine actionability. Uh, you have to change rewards and recognition systems. Data have to be um, important in getting rewards and getting recognition. And that means that you have to have uh, data scientists, data experts. You need to have funding schemes which accommodate the importance of the collection and the curation of data. You need to develop this European Open Science Cloud as um, a data infrastructure commons an ecosystem, and that's again emulating the internet. Um, and, as term, and as far as governance is concerned, it should be absolutely lightweight. There should not be a centralized, heavy uh, set of government mechanisms. And here is basically the picture. You have um, a large uh, set of distributed data collections with all different rules, um, and you have to provide, in the end, services to the scientists and to other stakeholders, to users. Um, but you ha and you ha so you have to make sure that there is interoperability. But that's what you have to do in a very lightweight manner. Minimal protocols in an exchange layer. It, this is just a picture, but it shows the basic idea uh, behind this. And so the question now really is uh, whether Europe will accept the lesson. This report, as I said, was very much based on how the Internet developed. Uh, but it's unclear whether the official reaction by the European Commission and by several large organizations in science um, um, really have understood or want to understand what this report says. Because people seem now to agree there should be a three-layer governance framework. An institutional layer, including the member states and the European Commission, an operational one, advisory one, and the f especially the first one, the institutional one, that rings all alarm bells, I think. Um, this is not how the Internet operates. There is no governance from governments on the Internet. And so the, uh, the point, I think, is we have to be careful and watch out. And so, research infrastructures are key for science. Um, we now need them for almost all fields of science, in different ways. And we are only gradually learning how, beyond the natural sciences, where we know more or less how this works, uh, how these research infrastructures should operate and should be governed. And we don't yet know in other fields 
how and why they can deliver. I'm sure they will in the end, but that's still a learning process which we are going through. Thank you very much. You. <laughs> you were just in time, Peter, so you can just calm down. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> I was thinking there, when you talked about resilience um, leadership and the, the endeavor there, could you tell us a little bit more, what was, the, what was the challenge with combining those different uh, individuals in a way that actually became resilience, as you say, and what is the key challenges there? Um, I think it follows uh, directly from the way um, the science itself developed. Um, um, in particle physics, it is inevitable, um, as of the late 20s, early 30s, um, that you had to uh, try to accelerate particles to understand what was happening in atomic nuclei. Mm. Um, and to do so in more and more detail, you need higher energy. Mm. And so you had to find ways of constructing larger accelerators. Um, and that means that uh, the organization of the field of science uh, went hand-in-hand hand with um, the way the science developed. Mm. And the same is happening in astronomy. In astronomy, uh, you had to construct ever larger telescopes. Um, they were more expensive, so you had to have a discussion among the astronomers. What is the priority? What fields? You uh, started to work in different frequency ranges, uh, so mm. there had to be a discussion on should we now build a Russian telescope or should we build um, another one, an optical one, um, etc., or in a, in a difficult frequency range. And so um, it is the, um, the development of the organization of the fields of science. And that is now the stage which we are seeing in, for example, life sciences, uh, where it's beginning to happen. Um, it has happened on a smaller scale in some of the social sciences. Mm. Um, and that is a process which takes time. Mm. I remember that um, in, in 2004, I think it has been, um, after the, um, we have set up in Europe a, an organization which is called the um, Initiative for Science in Europe. It's a mm. set of uh, larger European organizations. Um, the European Science Foundation was part of it, Euroscience, the European Life Sciences Forum, the European Physics Association, etc. And um, after the, and that was set up basically to support the establishment of the European Research mm -hmm. Council to make sure that the scientific community could put pressure on the process in the political arena. Mm. And after that first effort uh, to support the ERC, uh, we discussed uh, what should be next. And the idea was research infrastructures mm -hmm. should be next. And it was impossible to get a coherent approach, even in the life sciences at that time. And so they are learning mm. that they need these infrastructures. Mm. They are different from the big um, accelerators or telescopes, etc., or neutron or synchrotron radiation facilities. But they need still infrastructures, uh, but they have to be constructed in a different way and operated in a different way. But in a way, it was easier for physicists in the in the 20th century, you know, because it was not that much interplay between different uh, disciplines and so on. The physicists said, you could really do this. Wasn't that also the case? I mean, now we have so many other uh, ideas on what we want to do and how we want to use it. And the physicists are still the strongest. Yeah, sure, but, but still, I think that, that is the point which scientists have to understand. Yes. Um, they have to see and, and accept circumstances are different. Mm. Um, and we have also to involve people outside the science community um, in, in these and to me, of that is a resilience. Sorry? That is resilience to me. To yeah. sort of see others and 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 that we have sure. a sort of we but, can but meet still, different still, kind of challenges here because we but have still you have to you have to also accept uh, to make progress real progress in science in all these different fields uh, we now need uh, the general concept of infrastructures mm. and so at some point we have to bring back these discussions on okay and what does this mean when we want to develop an infrastructure exactly uh, what does it exist mm. of mm. what mm. how does mm. can it be governed how can it be operated etc mm. helga Novotny, please and more of you of course <coughs> have to, mm. yeah. 
um, I wanted to jump into your discussion right now. Physicists uh, have had it easier, you said, mm. but once you look a bit closer, you see they also had enormous difficulties. Of course. And Peter Gerlison, for instance, historian of science mm. at, at Harvard, has written in detail mm. about the difficulties that existed between getting theoreticians mm. aligned with engineers mm. and okay, with uh, experimentalists. Mm. So you had three different mm. communities, mm. two from physics, the engineers mm. coming from mm. an engineering background mm. to get uh, the, the bubble chamber mm. uh, set up, etc. Mm. But it, uh, the way how I see it now, it's not so much about coming with different disciplinary mm -hmm. backgrounds. People have realized mm. we need to be much more open in terms of disciplines. But there is an enormous management problem, an organizational problem. If you look at EMBO, and mm. if you compare this to the success stories that you have highlighted mainly from mm. physics, mm. EMBO has different labs in Europe, it's all under one roof, but they do very different things. You pointed out Cambridge, bioinformatics, mm. great place. Mm. You go to a place called Monte Rotondo near Rome, they were built on a mouse facility, uh. mm. and they have a very well-run, equipped mouse facility. Mm. But you do work there where you need these mice. Mm. Exactly. And, you know, mm. the management is different. Mm. No. Students ah. are trained in mm. different places. Mm. Um, the decision-making structure for running, not just mm. for setting up, but for keeping mm. it running, mm. uh, poses major challenges. Mm. And I think this we have mm. not solved as, as, as yet, mm. because there's this enormous diversity. Mm. And mm. in a way, um, we are moving, as Peter has pointed mm. out, from having one facility, you know, where everyone has to come together to do work there, mm. to uh, distributed mm. facilities mm. to everyone just needing a computer to tap into work that is being done in many, many places. Mm. And what this means for the governance, mm. for the management, mm. for the training, mm. for mobility, for mm. finding strong leaders, as, mm. as you said, mm. uh, it's, it's an open question. Mm. No comments. No, no, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's absolutely right. But you know what, <laughs> can, can we go back to your list of uh, uh, of success factors, because I think this is so. Um, do you know where you have it? It's it's fantastically helpful to with, with your view exactly. To since you've been uh, since you've been uh, active in this for so long, uh, if you see uh, those resilience of endeavor and and now with with Helga Novotny's comment on management. Uh, can you just give us a, a, a short hint of what you've learned and what, what, how this can be? Now, when we look, look in the future, how can we do it even better? How can we get the right individuals in place earlier? Well, I think um, a, a key point is that people accept that there must be leadership and management. Um, if you want to operate infrastructures, um, and it's even true if you... Uh, we had yesterday a discussion mm -hmm. about... Uh, whether or not everything is all right at the ETH Zurich. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a clear view that not everything is right there. <laughs> <laughs> and that has to do with leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and sure. so you have to accept yeah, you have that to come in now. Yeah. Um, also in, in a science organization, <laughs> there has to be leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. that's the first thing, acceptance mm -hmm. that this is necessary. Mm -hmm. And then leadership develops, because mm -hmm. um, there are differences between people, and some people have the capability of being a natural leader. Um, and th that needs training, of course, and you have to spot those people uh, who can do that. Uh, but I'm convinced that also in the life sciences and in the social sciences and humanities, you have these people. Um, and so if there is a need to operate an infrastructure, a very different one from the physical ones, which, um, which I've mentioned, uh, the distributed ones, then you need those leaders and you will find them. Please, who was first? Yes. May I just add something? I don't know what you said. That um, I think it's not only that you need strong leaders for research infrastructures, but that you also need really to understand their peculiarity. That they're not, they cannot be managed like an uh, academic institution, or a like corporate uh, institution, or public. Mm. It's, it's something in itself which mm. is different. Mm. Yeah, Thank sure. you. My way. <laughs> and you, please. <coughs> So my name is uh, 
Aileen Bominel. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm yes. a historian of... A little bit closer, please. Okay. I'm a historian of research and mm -hmm. science. And I'm interested in not only how to get success, but what success is. We had some really interesting, inspiring talks yesterday mm -hmm. uh, in which uh, there was a suggestion that su success can be managing to stay in business since 1962, if I'm referring to Professor Kao, uh, and reinventing yourself over and over again mm -hmm. as a laboratory. Uh, it's kind of internal success, but it's also external because, as Professor Cow said yesterday, you're addressing pertinent, important yep. global and exactly. social questions. Mm. And we had a wonderful talk by Professor Keller, mm. who was uh, trying to tell the difference between success being, uh, being open to the unexpected, mm. by serendipity mm. Mm. was the word mm. that you used mm. for it, mm. and on the other hand, uh, ticking off milestones. Mm. So we have so many different definitions of success in this very room, and mm. I'm just curious, when you talk about determinants for success, have, have you an idea of what success is? Well, um, <laughs> in, the, in, in the large physical uh, facilities, success is, in the first place, mm. uh, relatively simple uh, to be defined. Um, you, s you construct them because you have... There is a strong consensus view in a large community that this is where this science has. And so we have to find a piece of apparatus that can us help to get there. That's what we've done with the LHE. It, the Higgs, there, there was no doubt that was the purpose why you build that machine. And it has been found. But then, of course, people said, well, but we can do more. We can probably find, or hopefully find, pieces, elements of new physics. So we go on. Uh, but there will be a point when people will say, well, uh, it's at the end with the LHE, and then what next? Um, there has been a long discussion already in the science community, in the physics community, since the, since the early 90s on uh, what should be the next accelerator after these Hadron Colliders. Mm -hmm. Uh, it should be, there is unanimity almost about that, uh, it should be a linear um, electron accelerator. Um, but that is where the discussion still stands. Mm -hmm. um, there has been no consensus on what sort of thing it should be, where it should be built. Uh, that's still open, also because the funding is nowhere to be found at the moment. Um, so um, success in the first place is relatively straightforward. In astronomy, for the square kilometer array, there has been an impressive science case. Astronomers agree, if we can build this thing, we can find much more about the real origin of the universe, etc., etc. So that is, in the first place, success. Uh, but of course, <coughs> um, there will be a point for all these facilities when you have to decide either to close them down or to say, <coughs> can we repurpose them? Can we use them in a different way than we originally had intended? And you'll find always unexpected things, uh, which uh, will uh, lead you also with these large facilities to new ways of doing things. Um, and then there is a difference, of course, between the European spallation source here in Lund, the neutron source or the synchrotron sources. They, of course, are multi-purpose facilities for different fields of science. And so, in a way, um, it will be more easy for them uh, to find new purposes. You build the new instruments on this large facility uh, for different purposes. And instruments is an area where there is a huge development, um, as was mentioned yesterday. Um, uh, so, um, there is no end, I think, to what you can do with these sort of facilities. And that's why they have been developed for, to last for 40, 50 years. I'm convinced that we will have a nice discussion over coffee a little bit later, because this was a good start, and thank you so much for contributing to that. It's more complicated than we imagine. So by <coughs> this, I would like to thank you so very much, and it's my privilege to give to you a little medal for this. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it's not every day. Thank so you. Please, please wear it with pride and uh, be prepared for both. Yeah, thank you. Peter, whatever that can thank be. Thank you very so much. Thank you very much. So, please welcome our next speaker now. This is another um, builder of facilities uh, in Sweden, extremely well known uh, since um, he has um, been director of the Human Protein Atlas and uh, been the founding, or is the founding director of SciLife Labs, uh, professor of microbiology at the Royal Institute of Technology, etc., uh, etc. Et Matthias Ulian. 
welcome. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Uh, I always, when I meet politicians and uh, speak uh, politician uh, ways to fund, I always say there has to be a balance between basic research, applied research and strategic research. And in strategic research I, I usually mean infrastructures. And I do think that if you want to be a prosperous society in this new world, you have to have a balance between these three. How much you put on basic, how much you put on applied, that is, of course, something we should discuss, but all three parts has to be there. So what I thought I would uh, tell you is a case study of an infrastructure here in Sweden. It's the only national infrastructure in life science, so it's a bit, little bit unusual, and it's a very new one. So um, I would like to then say a little bit an introduction to this, talk about the national infrastructures, say a little bit about the research programs that are now going on, a little bit about translational research, since this is a topic of this symposium, um, and, and, and then say a little bit about my concluding remarks. So as a, as a start for this, the reason why we were put, starting an infrastructure in life science in Sweden for the first time, a national one, was really the new era of big data, technology-driven, and rather major infrastructure-driven uh, research in life science. Uh, so basically, you need multidisciplinary environments, and you need a lot of investment in infrastructure. But also, uh, being in Sweden, we have access to a lot of nice biobanks that was actually mentioned also by Dominic. Uh, and obviously, we would like to use these biobanks uh, with the new technologies to really try to benefit society uh, in the future. So, uh, to, uh, so what we decided then is to form a center with two nodes, one in Stockholm, one in Uppsala. It's hosted by four universities, so it was a little bit tricky to make four uh, vice chancellors to agree on things. We started in 2013, so it's, it's a relatively new center. I was the founding director. Uh, but we have grown very rapidly, so now there is about 1,200 researchers in these two sites. And then we also have researchers around uh, Sweden. Um, and the reason then, or the vision here, is to provide a unique and enabling infrastructure for molecular life science but also, of course, to facilitate collaborative research and also try to promote translation of biomolecular research. This is, of course, helped by the fact that we have had an incredible technology development in DNA analysis. So this is the cost of sequencing one of your genomes uh, all the way back to the first genome that costed $2 billion. Uh, and now we're down to about $1,000 for a genome. So, uh, and this is, of course, an incredible development. And I'm very proud, proud that one of the uh, innovations uh, from my group actually was the first of these so-called next generation sequencing instruments. And you can kind of see when the, when the cost was going down. So at SciLife Lab, we've done a lot of sequencing in the last four or five years, and this is just some of the organisms that has been sequenced. But the main focus has really to be in, in, in the clinical field, sequencing patients and, and, and human beings. It's very interesting for us being in life science that we're kind of hitting what also the physicists have found for many years, and that is the challenge to go from data to knowledge. Uh, it's a little bit arrogant maybe to cite yourself, but in the Nature article here, um, uh, I'm saying when it comes to big data, it's easier to generate the data than to get knowledge out of it. And I think this is certainly very true for life science. And also for us then, we want then to move from knowledge into clinical applications, which is also very, very hard. Uh, but in order to do that, then, what we've done at SciLife Lab is that we have uh, recruited a lot of bioinformatics people. These are IT experts in life science, and we now have only in Stockholm more than 200 dedicated bioinformatics researchers, uh, uh, which of course helps now in the analysis of all this data. 
Uh, so, the, as I said, the original Xilaf lab was in two nodes, the main one in Stockholm at the Karolinska campus and the second one in Uppsala. But we now also have nodes in Umeå, Linköping, Lund and Göteborg and I will come back to that. The, 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 envir the, the development in Stockholm has been uh, quite dramatic. So we started in July 2010, before it was a national infrastructure, to have one floor in a new building. Then we added another floor in 2011 and another floor in 2013. We grow out of that building and we actually build it a new one. And, and that's the Gamma building. And just actually next month we will take the last the sixth uh, level of all, also that building. And then we will have two buildings, about 800 people. Um, and actually, this is on this slide, just showing you how we have then increased relatively rapid from being, I was the employee number one back in 2010, and now we are uh, only in Stockholm, about 800 people. So, um, um, so, of course, you have to organize this. I'm not going to bore you too much. I just want to say that it's a kind of standard setup where you have a national board, you have a management group, and you have an uh, international advisory board. So this is the national board has representative from most of the universities in Sweden. Um, and the International Advisory Board, of course, is experts from around the world. Uh, and then you have the management group, and I stepped down about two years ago. So what about the financials then? So the, the base funding from the government is, uh, is about 250 million um, sec. So that's about 40, well, about 25 million euros. Uh, but then we have user fees and we have other infrastructure support from external sources. So we estimate that we have, at least last year, about 630 million in infrastructure support. But then, of course, we have a lot of research also being done, uh, and this is external research, mainly uh, by the researchers uh, from different research councils and so on. And, and uh, last year, it was about 690 million. So it's about equal split then between infrastructure and research, and I think this is extremely good balance between these two. So the summary then of SciLife Lab, it has it existed about four years as a national center. It is now one of the three major research infrastructures in Sweden. We only have three. Two are here in Lund, uh, the ESS and MAX4, and one is the Stockholm Uppsala one in, in life science, the SciLife Lab. Uh, our infrastructure is jointly operated by four universities. Um, and the d direct governmental funding then is about 40 million euros, and the t total funding is about 140 million euros. And we are about 1,200 scientists. So what do we do then? Uh, I'm not going to bore you too much with technology here, but of course it is important then that we have different technical platforms, and the idea is that we should have platforms that are not very easy to have in all universities, but instead to provide them in one source and then have equal access wherever you are in Sweden, if you're in a university. So these 10 platforms also have 40 facilities, and some of these facilities are also outside Stockholm, Uppsala. So we have several facilities here in Lund and several in Göteborg and so on. This just shows you again the representatives brought by several by, by, by the universities, and I'm not going to go into the details here, just to say that some of these facilities are in, in, in the host universities and some are outside, like for example here in Lund. So what has been very good for us is that we can very early then really go in and 
purchase and uh, resources, infrastructure resources, that was not really possible if you were a single university in a sin single university. So, for example, the super resolution CRAUIM, these instruments are very expensive, about 100 million Swedish, and very early on we could buy those. And it was kind of nice to see that they also got this technology, got the Nobel Prize this year in chemistry. But also on the sequencing side, the, the fact that we have a national infrastructure has then allowed us then to actually buy all the new equipment and be sort of state on the art on that side. I'm very proud of one of the platforms, and that is the clinical platforms, where we have used this technology to start uh, to sequencing patients. And I don't have time to go into the details now, but now more than 1,000 babies have been sequenced, whole genome sequenced, in order to find inherited diseases and guide the, the physician about how to treat these patients where we have an unknown known, un, where, it's not, uh, uh, where it's not known what kind of disease they have. Uh, and at least in three cases, there are babies that would have been brain dead that has been completely saved and are now happy. So we, it, that is, of course, uh, really, really nice for us. Uh, this has been such a success, so we decided then to put clinical sequencing units also in Lund, in Göteborg, and also in Umeå, um, uh, and in Uppsala. So we will then have this kind of, of analysis also in other parts of Sweden. So what about the use of infrastructure? So uh, here you can see the statistics. Uh, last year there was close to 4,000 formal projects being run through the facilities. <coughs> and, and about 35% of these came from users outside the host universities. And that might sound, sound rather low, but actually the outside the, the host universities represent about 50% of life science. So it is a little bit lower than it should be, and we are actively trying to have the academic users also from the other universities chipping in and, or using the facility. We have focused on the academics, so there are very few now um, users from industry, but it is growing, as you can see here, uh, and we also have some collaborations with international, but actually our money is to actually support academic research in Sweden. It's also very important to do educational events, and we do a lot of them. We, uh, in average, we are uh, occupying, I think, two events per day. So it is, I uh, know, uh, every second day, one. So we had, I think, close to 200 training events last year. Uh, and we, of course, uh, this is, of course, uh, very important. We also try to brand life science uh, internationally and one way of doing that is to that we founded a prize together with the science magazine and AAAS in the states uh, and we call it the science for life prize for young scientists and the idea there is that you you are competing with your phd thesis um, and it's an annual prize and it's the editors of science, which are very reputed, that actually chooses the prize winner. Uh, and the winner assets is this published in science. And all of the prize winners, they have a very glorious career in front of them. Uh, and they also will be able to come in December, meet the Nobel Prize uh, lawyers, and actually go to the Nobel banquet. So it's kind of a very nice event for them. Unfortunately, uh, there's most of the winners come from the United States, so we're hoping that we will get more prize winners also from Europe and Asia. A little bit about the research. Um, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit. There are now 146 uh, research leaders that have moved into SciLife Lab. Uh, but maybe more important is that we have then started the Science for Life Fellow Program, which is a six-year program where people are recruited uh, sort of on the, on the assistant professor level, and then they are guaranteed a 10-year track, and we get very nice uh, support. And we have, in most cases, more than 100 applicants for every position, and this has been a very big success for us. 
Um, I also want to say that the Va Knut and Wallace Wallenberg Foundation has then decided to support the Science for Life by supporting the other universities with a lot of money, 800 million sec. And these are then money that goes to research in these other universities and hopefully then they can use the Scilife lab facilities. And we are of course very pleased about that. Then I thought I would just quickly say a few research pro projects in SciLife Lab, and I'm sort of uh, taking my own f sort of programs uh, uh, as an example. One is then to look at the building blocks of human beings, uh, because almost all of the drugs are towards proteins, uh, and proteins can predict health and so on. So what we would like to do in this program is to really map all the building blocks of human beings. So this started actually before SciLife Lab, uh, uh, and it was funded by a philanthropy foundation, uh, but it has then moved into SciLife Lab, and it actually involves six universities in Sweden, but also very important sites in Asia. So the first sort of flagship paper from this effort came two years ago in science, this is where are these building blocks in the different parts of, of your bodies. So what proteins, uh, we, all of you in this room have 20,000 Lego pieces, proteins, uh, and, and we now know which are in the brain, which are in the kidney and so on. And we publish this in science and we already have 1,400 citations in two years, so we're very pleased about that. Then we moved on and looked into the smallest unit in the human body called the cell, uh, and then say, where are the proteins inside the cell? Which are in the mitochondria, which are in the nucleus, and so on. And we just published in May, a few months ago, the cell atlas where uh, researchers can go in and, and, and look at these different uh, locations. And then just a few weeks ago, we had the third sort of flagship paper from this program, and that is a pathology atlas, a cancer atlas. And this is unusual in the sense that we have downloaded data, mainly from the United States and NIH, and then used a supercomputer center, uh, 400,000 core hours, and then reanalysis of this data, and then published it in science a few weeks ago without doing a single experiment, which is, of course, very unusual in the life science community. So now the, uh, the, uh, pro the Human Protein Atlas, which is sort of the headquarters of Science for Life, has then three parts, a tissue atlas, a cell atlas, and a pathology atlas. So Dominique was talking about Elixir, and just a few months ago in July, they announced what are the core resources in Europe for, for, uh, for core data resources. And we have very, most of these core resources, just as he was saying, are at the EBI in Hingston, outside Cambridge in UK. But there is at least two resources outside the UK, and one of them is now the Human Protein Atlas. And we are, of course, very pleased that this EU organization thinks that this resource is of fundamental importance for the wider life science community. I should also say that we are very grateful to the Wallenberg Foundation that has allowed us to put all the data in, in open access, so there's no restrictions, uh, which of course also means that we have a lot of visitors. I find actually, uh, so we have about 250,000 visitors per month to, the, to, the, to, the, to our site. Uh, it's incredibly interesting actually to see where they come from and you can kind of see where is life science actually being done in the world and you can see of course the United States with its east and west coast you see Europe is doing very well and you can also see the Southeast Asia here uh, so we have now more than 200 countries that have gone into our site and the major one is of course United States but China used to be number 15, it has now moved up to number second, and you can kind of see now what is happening in the world. China is the runner-up for the United States, and now, of course, Europe has to fight back. Um, also, what is quite interesting is that all of this effort, it's a lot of fun, it has come 
completely from philanthropy. So here is just the sort of funda the, 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 um, the, 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 the funding for this project, uh, although we also have some funding then from Elixir. So the second thing I want to talk about is then uh, another research program at SciLife Lab uh, involving wellness profiling. So basically what we would like to know is can we have molecular fingerprints of our health? Uh, and then can we follow people and ask uh, and find early signs of, of, of disease? And then what we try to do then is to combine the classical diagnostics with advanced bioimaging and then use all these new technologies that have been developed at SciLife Lab. So basically, SciLife Lab Wellness Profiling, we use a biobank effort that started in Göteborg, but it now involves all the universities, including Lund. Um, and then we use that uh, as a base to then move on with, with uh, some people. And I'll come back to this. Uh, and basically, we take 100 individuals, and every three months, we take almost all samples you can think about, um, and then we actually use all the platforms and facilities, more or less, at SciLife Lab to analyze. So these people is the most uh, analyzed people on this planet, actually, which is kind of uh, nice. Um, so what very quickly we could do then is to use the network from the SciLife Lab, involve six, actually seven universities, um, and people that are then involved and can do different parts. And I'm not going to go into the details here, but just to say that these 100 individuals, and actually after one year there were still 99. That just shows that the nurse that we have is very good at keeping people, because they have to stay a whole day and giving a lot of different samples. Uh, so we, know we have activity trackers, so we know when they are sleeping and when they are walking and, and going in stairs. We do the sort of standard measurements. We do very advanced medical imaging, uh, whole genome sequencing, and then a lot of analysis of the blood, uh, the cells, the metabolome, which is the metabolites, the small molecules in the blood, the, and also the bacteria, the microbes in, in the gut. And we do this every uh, three months. So we've done this now for one and a half year, uh, and I'm not going to go into the details, but what is so incredibly interesting is that we can start to uh, understand uh, if we have a, a sort of a unique molecular fingerprint. And what we can see now is that everyone in this room has his own protein profile, his own immunocell profile, and it stays constant during one year. So at, uh, we, of course, have only followed them for one year so far, but we're going into this second year. So we hope then that this could then be a baseline that we can then use uh, to analyze uh, if for, for diseases and so on. So um, uh, um, I'm getting... Uh, my last point then is to talk a little bit about translational. So in the, the government actually gave us funding to work with uh, what we call a drug development platform, uh, and that is to try to take all this data and then translate it so we can help academic researchers to actually uh, apply their research and even be commercial. And there's a lot of text here, so I will not go through it. Um, and that we also do in collaboration with a lot of different companies, and these are just uh, some sampling of the companies that we're working on. But I also think it's very interesting to see that this has impact. So only in the last two, or th two years, there has been significant, actually, investments from multinational uh, companies to actually in drug manufacturing in Sweden. And this is, of course, it was unheard of just 10 years ago that these big companies are actually also doing manufacturing. And the reason they are doing this is because there is a good science culture in Sweden. I also thought I would just say uh, that we also are working quite a lot with startups, and this is just happens to be the startups that uh, 
that uh, it has sort of come from my group. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see one of them is actually from Lund, but it has been it has had a significant input also from, from the SciLife lab. And what you can see here is uh, four of them are now listed on, on NASDAQ and has a market cap of about 10 billion Swedish, so it, it's quite nice. And some are, are, are private, and for example, Atlas Antibodies has 98% uh, of the products is actually export. So we're providing actually benefits back to society. But also it's very interesting to see when we are now moving into patients. So this is just one example of a, a, a cancer drug that was developed between SciLife Lab and, the, and, and some, a company in South Korea, which has, I have been co-funded. Uh, and what you can see here, this is the tumor uh, size uh, in a mouse model when you treat with this new drug. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased that only about a month ago, this company was then did an IPO in South Korea and is now worth a lot of money. Uh, another very nice story is uh, a biological therapeutics that was developed in collaboration between the people at SciLife Lab and, and, uh, and uh, a company called Affibody, which I'm a co-founder of. <coughs> and this is just data from this summer, a patient in England. Uh, which is very severe psoriasis um, and is so severe that it's, it's impossible for him to work and, and even s almost sleep. So he's in pretty bad shape. You get one dose of this new drug that I don't have time to go into and he's, pr uh, he's more or less symptom free in two weeks. So it's almost like a miracle and we are of course very pleased about this and are moving it through the different clinical phases. So in conclusion then, I think it's very exciting that we are now being able to systematically do, uh, do mapping of the building blocks of life. And so being a Swede, I'm of course very proud that Linnaeus did the systematics of biology back in the 1700s, that Berzelius and other people in Sweden actually discovered more than one quarter of the, of the chemical elements, uh, which actually made into the Mendelian uh, periodic table. Uh, uh, in the 1900s, of course, the physics has done a lot of things, but now, uh, at least I'm a little bit partial here, uh, but uh, now is the century where we will uh, systematically go through the building blocks of humans and other, li li uh, and other organisms. So um, we are uh, quite ahead here in Sweden because we have been doing this for quite a while. The Human Protein Atlas at SciLife Lab is funded by the Wallenberg, but now there is a lot of initiatives around the world to move into this. And it's very interesting to see where is the, the, the funding coming from. So the Paul Allen from Microsoft is putting a lot of money into a Cell Atlas Institute in Seattle. The John Zuckerberg is putting $600 million into a Cell Atlas initiative at Stanford. Uh, Google, and I, Google is putting a lot of money into wellness profiling. Uh, in a product called Baseline Verily. And IBM is using their Watson technology and the Watson computers to actually move into health. So what you can see here is that we have been sort of working with this uh, systematic mapping now for 15 years, but now the competitors is, is Microsoft, it's Facebook, Google and IBM, and we really didn't expect this in life science only two or three years ago. So it's also very nice that um, the Zuckerberg also is giving money uh, in a call for proposal. And yesterday they announced what uh, proposals they are funding for this new kind of genome project, what they call the Human Cell Atlas project. And what you can see here is uh, that uh, they actually they've supported 36 groups most of them obviously in the United States, at Stanford and MIT and so on, but also seven groups were supported in, in, in Europe. And what you can see here is that two of these groups are at SciLife Lab in Stockholm. So we're very pleased about that. One of them is for our group and another one is a group at, at Karolinska. So, um, um, so my take home message then 
and is and I guess I've gone through a lot of different uh, information here, but what I find so exciting right now is that in life science we have new tools to systematically study the building blocks of of, of humans, but also other organisms. But also being an engineer by heart. Uh, it, uh, but always been working with medical research. It's nice to see this very big push of technology and data-driven research in medical research, which means that it is actually right now very easy to have a sort of an engineering background and a computer background and work with life science. So with that, I just want to thank you for your attention and just show you the, the, the site up in Stockholm where you have the Karolinska Institute here. This is the most expensive hospital ever built. Um, I'm not sure that's very good. Uh, and, and here you have the SciLife Lab where we have these two buildings now with 800 researchers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. <laughs> Perfect. We have yeah. 10 minutes for questions. Yes. Yes, so please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, back there first. Christoph Quittmann, Max 4. At the beginning of your talk, you emphasized the need for basic, applied, and strategic research. Mm -hmm. um, and I fully subscribe to that. How do you manage to um, make that happen in reality with the change in funding, with the many uh, different projects and stakeholders that you have? How do you manage this portfolio uh, spanning such a uh, wide range of things in... Well, we all uh, wonder that, don't we? Yeah, How uh, do you do it? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, of course, when I talk about that, I'm talking about the society and the politicians, what they su should support. Uh, it is interesting, though, that what in, in our case, it is very much also a balance in what we do between basic research applied and, and strategic. Uh, and I think for us, it's very much an, an, um, you're driven by the funding you're getting uh, and some of the funding. And we have got, I have to say, a lot of funding for strategic research, which is rather unusual. The Wallenberg fam family has given us almost 150 million euros mm -hmm. uh, over actually 20 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously that is, you know, I usually mm -hmm. say to my young uh, researchers, that's the sort of funding you should have. A 20-year <laughs> project, uh, 150, then it's very easy. But of mm -hmm. course it is not very easy because you have to deliver and you have to, you know, uh, deliver what you promised. When it comes to politicians, mm -hmm. what I, you know, I find sometimes very awkward that our scientists, the scientific research community, sometimes push, say, that we should support basic research. And then there are others, rather few actually, that says that we should support applied research. Uh, and then, especially in life science, there are very few that says we should then support strategic research or life science research. Mm -hmm. So obviously, I think, and, and to me that is, you know, it's just crazy. We have to have these three. Um, and basically then how much you put into basic research applied and strategic, that is of course what you should debate. And of course in Sweden, like in uh, all countries in, in, in Europe, almost all money goes to basic research. But people don't actually think so. Uh, so, so obviously this is something that one has to actually show in, with, with data. It's also very interesting that to see the flood of philanthropy going into uh, science and life mm -hmm. science right now. So in the United States, it used to be, I think, 4% of the funding to universities with philanthropy. Uh, I think last year it was 36%. So it is incredible force. And we could, of course, see the same thing here in Sweden, that a lot of long-term strategic infrastructure, no, strategic research is actually supported by, by philanthropy. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, philanthro the philanthropy money, the foundations actually contributes mm -hmm. for this balance in a very nice way, I would mm -hmm. say. More comments on this, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Uh, Helga Novotny first, and then you. Yes, sorry. Thank you for giving us this mm -hmm. um, 
wonderful overview and a fascinating work in progress. I have two questions. What did uh, you find in your cancer atlas that you did not know before? And my second question relates to your wellness profile project, mm -hmm. where you do work in a much more comprehensive way that also some of the large corporations are doing, mm -hmm. with fitness bands mm -hmm. and various mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. data collection methods. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned rightly that there is a big interest on the part of Google, Microsoft, etc., mm. in the work you do. Mm. But I would like to hear more about, in the end, it's an asymmetrical relationship of a particular kind, or how do you see the future development mm. of this kind of mm -hmm. relationship? Mm. Science, the data are open. Mm. The companies have their uh, interest not to keep the data mm. open. So how do you manage mm. and how do you see the future development? Okay. Mm. So I start with the first question. What did we find when we published, well, what did we would mm. in, the, in, in the science article? Mm. And I think the most astonishing for us is that we found a lot of genes that are involved. So what we are looking at is the, how much proteins are produced in the cancers and how that relates to the outcome, the clinical survival of the patient, because mm -hmm. that is very interesting for the physician. And we found that almost half of the, um, about 10,000 genes, so 10,000 proteins, actually had a consequence, at least in, in one of the major cancers. What we did uh, find, though, and astonishing, is that it, ha it has consequences for the, for the average patient. But it was very hard when you actually look at the data to get guidance on the individual patients. So I think what we are saying, what we are, what we are finding is something that the oncologist knows. It the prognostic markers are actually, it's, it's, you can get very nice so-called Kaplan-Meier meyer plots, uh, which are survivor plots, with very nice uh, significance, 10 to the minus 10. Uh, but yet, when you actually sit in front of a patient, it is too much noise to actually use it. So it's a rather depressing uh, take-home message. Uh, but of course, the beauty here is that we can use uh, the, the, the cancer genome atlas in the States almost costed $1 billion. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of data, no one can access it. So it's actually a very good example of sharing of data and actually doing that and then actually preventing a lot of young scientists to work on these kind of prognostic markers because there's a lot of research out there. I still believe that we can use these technologies to actually guide uh, pay, uh, the, mm. the doctor in the future, but we are not there yet. This is mm. a sort of a progress report. Mm. When it comes to this, what was the second question? That was yeah. about Google and so on. Yeah. Um, of course, they are very interested. Uh, there is a lot of work now being done in the States, as you know, but also in Europe on fitness bands and so on. So all of our all of our interventions has fitness bands, of course. It is kind of amazing how little you, you at least we get information from, from that. Uh, so instead, what we are trying to do is use the new modern technologies to look what is happening in th with the immune cells in the blood, the protein profiles in the blood. Uh, and it's amazing how little we are analyzing at this point. But with these new technologies, we can look at thousands of proteins in a multiplex fashion. Um, so we haven't published a single paper yet. So obviously, I p foresee that there will be a lot of interest from Google and others to move in. But again, of course, from these profiles, you need to actually find profiles which are relevant mm. for biological age, uh, if you get uh, diseases and so on. And uh, they, we are still sort of now in the data generation phase, and we haven't moved to the... We, I think we moved to the knowledge phase, but we haven't moved to the clinical application mm. phase. Mm. Yeah. Just yeah. Um, specify my, my question a bit more. How do you see the future relationship between the kind of work you do mm or that Lee Hartwell does mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and other people 
uh, compared to what these big corporations do, where we have little interchange with them, what they do, we don't know. Mm -hmm. They're the collecting data. Um, They're interested mm -hmm. in the tools that you are developing mm -hmm. now. And how do you see the future mm -hmm. development? No, it's a very good question. So we've had a, a long, long discussion with IBM Watson mm -hmm. team. Um, uh, because we used to have uh, an open access but not for commercial use. And then through the Elixir, we have actually moved to an even more, um, uh, I can't remember the acronym, but it's, it's an open access where also companies can use it. So now we are sending in all our data to IBM Watson. They are downloading it and using it. And uh, we're kind of happy with it actually. Um, so w I kind of see this as, you know, I have started 14 companies so, and have uh, almost 100 patents. So obviously for me, I can see the beauty of the open access for basic research and basic knowledge. But as soon as you move into something interesting, you sort of goes on the commercial route. And what we are hoping is that if you're the creator of the, o the basic information, you have some sort of advantage when you want to move into the next phase. But, I, but in the end of the day, I just want our doctors to have better information about the patients in front of them. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think we're still not in the stone age, but we are still in a very kind of black box kind of environment where I want more data mm -hmm. to be introduced to the general practitioner. This is so interesting, but we have more <laughs> questions also, so we have to discuss over, over coffee as well. Please, yes. Hi, um, my name is Matt Beats. I'm from UC Irvine and the Pufendorf Institute. Um, and I was interested mm -hmm. in, um, you, you know, you've talked about this as, as a life sciences cluster, but it's obviously very interdisciplinary. Think about yes. something like even development of, of you know, sequencing technologies is not just just molecular biology, but it's also materials technology and Absolutely. physics and everything else that goes into that. How do you work to encourage that kind of interdisciplinary with interdisciplinarity within an institute? Yeah, like that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the whole idea where I pushed the politicians very much for the science for life was the fact that I, I. I I, I really don't, I prefer to call it multidisciplinary than interdisciplinary because I really believe in having multidisciplines coming together and obviously SciLife Lab is just that. We have the people from Karolinska which comes with the medical expertise, we have the people from the Royal Institute coming with the technical uh, and that's both from physics and chemistry and, and molecular biology. And then we have the people from the Stockholm University in natural science, which is very much computer science and, and even uh, so in some cases, uh, well, more ethical science and so on. No, so this is not very, I mean, uh, I think one way of doing it is to put people in the same uh, house. Uh, in the early days, I tried to make sure that every floor in that building, there are 12 floors, should have people from every, all three universities in mm -hmm. Stockholm. Mm -hmm. This has been a very hard struggle for mm -hmm. me, uh, because uh, people from Karolinska wants to be with people from Karolinska and so on. So I, How did you do it? I failed. <laughs> 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 Thank uh, you for being honest. At yeah. <laughs> well, so no. Uh, so now there are physicists from Uppsala, they came from Stockholm. Or yeah, sort of. But they they are still in the same uh, house. House. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, and, and there is of course a lot of technology being development, and as mm -hmm. you say, a lot of that is actually. Um, we have a lot of physicists ha that has moved to SciLife Lab, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of laser technology, there's a lot of material science, there's a lot of microfluidics, nanotechnology, and so on. So uh, I, since I was kind of uh, could choose what groups to relocate, I could pick groups that I thought would... Uh, would uh, mm -hmm. um, and I, maybe I should say at this point, we are 1,200 people, but we didn't recruit from scratch 1,200 people. In this case, we did something rather unusual. We actually formed a building 
And then we actually just relocated people from universities, but they stayed affiliated or uh, to their universities. So we didn't have to take, you know, there's not a formal employment into. And this they were sitting there basically. They are, mm -hmm. they are, it's basically, in a way, one could say it as a research house. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then, of course, since we have a lot of money, we could also recruit these 18 so SciLife Lab fellows and, and so on. So, yeah, the that was a long answer to your... environment. Yeah. But, but we are touching now upon, upon leadership and, and uh, we've talked earlier about the m management challenges and mm. so on. And when I listen to you, I, I wonder how much of this success is Matthias Ullian? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because... Because being a Swede, I mean, you've been around for so long, we've heard about you, and I can't help thinking that the, the greatest asset that all those labs and all what you show today is, is actually trust. Yeah, it's trust, and you've built it uh, for a long time, you have all those connections, mm. but you're also an, an excellent communicator of what you're doing. So I wonder now, where are the small Matthias's and what, what is the next generation and how do you spill over and how, how on earth do you do it? No, but there is a lot of uh, f fantastic scientists and actually right now I have nothing to do with SciLife Lab. Um, well, I'm, I'm a scientist there. <laughs> Uh, but I don't have anything to do mm. with the management. So, but do you think it's important? Do you think if you try to put yourself outside this mm. gigantic yeah, yeah, endeavor, yeah, yeah. how important is it to have such a person, a driver? Well, I don't think it's important to have a Matthias Ullen, but no? I think it's good Somebody. to have a. Uh, it's good to have someone with a vision uh, and a clear uh, mind, which are not. Um, selfish you know mm -hmm. you want to do it because you want to do it for the mm -hmm. country and and for science um, so uh, i guess that's called uh, mm. research leadership that's and called research leadership yes mm -hmm. and uh, you need someone like mm -hmm. that i think Be and i have to say the first three and a half years we were only stockholm it was very easy we moved together with Uppsala, which had a very different way of doing things and it was and and um, when we became national and it was much much harder mm -hmm. it was a lot of you know political battles mm -hmm. for every decision um, but in the end of the day it worked out yeah. yesterday we heard alan larson talk about this this team when when ess was established and uh, peter tindemans was one core uh, person there and uh, we have Lars Borison of course as a, I think he's here somewhere there mm. <laughs> as a sort of driver f at the beginning and then and then uh, uh, of course Alan Larsson himself and uh, Lars Leijenborg so, so the key persons that could actually uh, mm. take on different uh, areas mm. in society to get this on board mm. uh, so uh, have you also that sort of strategy in mind that you 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 use different individuals to sort of cope with different challenges yeah, at a strategic level, yeah. or do you do it all yourself? No, of course I had a. a no, I was just. Yeah, no, no. Of course I had a management group. It was a little bit interesting because the management group, my management group, was appointed by the presidents of the four universities, not by me. Uh, I guess you would call that so a collegial sort of type of leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a big fan of that mm -hmm. uh, because obviously the uh, my management group. This then is so interesting. My yes, management sorry. group <laughs> then sort of had, without saying too much, of course they saw themselves as a representative of their of university, they did, yes. which meant that they were first thinking about oh, the university mm. and then about the science. Mm. So, so then so comes the challenge to see the whole picture. So, so, so what mm -hmm. I then, when I handed this over two years ago to a new mm. director, one of the things that I made sure was that this was not the way you... Mm. Uh, so now we have a management group which is appointed by the new director. Mm. But it has to be approved by each of the presidents and that's a very big difference. Let's continue this discussion. Yeah. Is, is there a, a very, very eager question? I can take it now, because otherwise I need coffee, and I mm -hmm. think you do. So, so let's continue around coffee. And Matthias, I know that you have a lot of medals already, but this will be the... 
oh, I'm the nicest one of all because okay. it's the 350th anniversary of Lund University. Okay. So bear it with pride and thank you so very much for coming here. I put it on right directly. Now. The face board the Pusvansk okay. going asker. The full on Pusvansk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Back at 11 everybody. And don't uh, miss the opportunity to talk to the speakers in the break.
Hallå där! Hallå. All right, everybody, please take your seats <laughs> for the last trip <coughs> today. We have two um, lectures ahead. Uh, a little change of the program now. Uh, first of all, Helga Novotny will speak, and after that, in the program, it says Björn O. Nilsson, but he did his speak yesterday. So instead, um, Mats Benner and Thomas Kaiserfeldt will sort of make a concluding um, uh, speech where they try to summarize a little what we've heard those two days. Okay? So uh, it's a pleasure and honor to uh, introduce you to the next uh, speaker. And uh, Helga Novotny was the, um, was the president of the ERC for, for many years. But she's an extremely talented uh, author as well. Uh, I have read many of her books and uh, I have enjoyed the way she connects science to communication, that happens to be my field of work, but also to people and to society. And uh, this morning uh, I had the pleasure of uh, just having a coffee with her and uh, you know she says something like this, what are the real strengths of science? What are the real strengths of science? Questions like that, that we should discuss more. So please welcome Helga Novotny. Okay. Thank you very much. This was the shortest and nicest introduction that I listened to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So as you see from my title, I want to speak about openness of science and <clears throat> towards the end of what I understand to be the real radical openness of science. We hear <clears throat> a lot about openness these days. And it's very appealing. You could even say we live in the age of the crowd and of the cloud. We heard about the European uh, open science cloud. There are other kinds of clouds that we all uh, sometimes deposit our data in. And openness is part of the way how we conceive, imagine our, si our society to be. Everyone <coughs> is connected to everyone else. Networking has become very important. Young people come to events in order to do networking. And <coughs> there is a spirit and an awareness that we have to work together if we want to achieve anything uh, at all. So the concept of openness and whatever imagine we imagine it to be has become pervasive and ubiquitous. It has also moved very much into the middle of the policy domain. In fact, one could argue <coughs> that to be open has become a policy imperative. And at, <coughs> sorry, at the level of the European Commission, uh, Commissioner Mödas, has made this part of his program. He speaks about the three O's, open science, open innovation, and open uh, to the world. And of course, the reasoning behind it is not so difficult uh, to understand. Openness of science means for science to be open towards innovation, to uh, do away with the kind of boundaries that have existed in many places, especially in Europe, if we compare ourselves with the, with the US, between the more academic world and the world of industry, and of course also a strong appeal and policy imperative to young people to be open to entrepreneurial ideas, to have startups at the university and to um, <coughs> move towards innovation, as you can also see in, in this picture here. The promise behind it is clear. It should be a win-win situation for everyone. 
But as you could guess from my question to the last speaker, to Matthias Ulen, I was hinting at the fact maybe there are some asymmetries in the openness that we witness. In this case, academia is open, publishes its result, it's open access, and yet we have large corporations who are very <clears throat> much uh, working with less openness. They are keen to get the data, yet they are not open in giving their data away. And this is one of the structural asymmetries. I'm not blaming anyone, I'm just saying. Uh, when we speak about opening, we should also keep in mind um, what is, um, who is included, who is excluded, and that the lines that we very often draw, open and not open, are not so clear as they seem at first sight. Why now? <clears throat> a question that needs to be asked, but the answer, I think, is very simple. We live in <clears throat> the flood of data that are being generated with an enormous speed. We have heard of biobanks and data banks of various kinds already, and I think also yesterday this was part <clears throat> of, of your discussion. And of course, for research infrastructures, I'm not going to speak more about research infrastructures, but having known Peter uh, Tindemans for a long time and having sort of seen also the way at European level as we um, form, etc., develop, I think for research infrastructures of this uh, particular kind, openness has always played a very important role because you have only one shared facility that is being open and must be open for the many users. And the way how you do it can, can differ, but uh, this was sort of embedded in this concept of infrastructure. But now <clears throat> we have very different ways of opening, and uh, a bit later I want to come back also to um, <clears throat> some different contexts in which we can discuss opening. So where do we stand with uh, this kind of openness? And <clears throat> as you can guess from these remarks, I'm also seeing some constraints to openness. The boundary between openness and not open is not as strict. We have to look at the context, we have to look at the timing, and <clears throat> we also have to see what is behind it. And whenever you have constraints, the concepts we use become somewhat more ambivalent. And I would claim, at least in some of the examples that I want to take you through, there is also some ambivalence that is in this concept of openness. And let me start with my own ESC experience. Now, the ESC is open. We are also open to the world. Whoever wants to apply for an ESC grant, as long as uh, the person is willing to spend half of the time to work in Europe, we are also open to the world. And the concept of excellence, and the ESC stands for excellence only, as you are well aware, signals we are open for all talented people with excellent ideas and who are excellent people. And yet, <clears throat> if you look at, um, this is the enormous, it also shows how much um, my colleagues in the various panels and at the headquarters in Brussels have to do. This shows you a distribution of the project applications that needed to be evaluated and where they come from. And here you see <clears throat> a picture of the aspirations. And people apply also for different reasons. From the very beginning, we had the problem that we were swamped with applications from Italy, partly out of the desperate need to get any kind of funding that you don't get at home. Even if you know the chances are very small, you get this. The UK, <clears throat> from a very strong science base, also decided uh, the more you apply, the greater your chances you will get. And <clears throat> you also see the countries um, where applications are uh, not uh, as frequent. 
but here's the outcome. And what you see is not surprising, we know it, <clears throat> but we very often don't associate it with the imaginary of openness and inclusiveness that we have in mind. Of course, we think science is inclusive. We take it for granted. It's marriage-based. We look for excellence. We want to be open to talented people wherever they come from. And yet, the outcome after a serious peer-reviewed process shows it's a very skewed distribution. It's a concentration effect that we have. And this is not just Europe. If you go to the US, you have a concentration on the coastlines, be it east and west, and uh, much less in the middle. And if you look at uh, maps of the world, you see a very strong concentration in the north. You see China coming up very rapidly. We had another slide uh, from, from this morning. And the rest of the world pretty much is not uh, well represented on this map. So what is going on here? <clears throat> Partly it is the result of what we call the Matthew effect in science. The Matthew effect, for those of you who have not heard the term before, is taken from the Bible. It comes from my teacher at Columbia University, Robert Merton, who coined it way, way back in, uh, he wrote a, a paper that was published in Science. Imagine a paper publishing in Science, eight pages at that time in 68, where he laid out the concept of the Matthew effect. The Matthew effect says that there is a disproportionate attribution of credit in science being given to those people who already have, who are already well known for their work, who are recognized as having contributed to science. And it is this kind of recognition, scientific recognition for your contributions to the community, that is the real currency of science. And this currency plays an important role in our present funding system because the higher your recognition, the more funds you are likely to get, the more funds you have will allow you to employ more PhD students or postdocs. The more people you have working with you, the more output you will generate, which again contributes to your scientific recognition. So we have a cycle here that is striving and that is behind the Matthew effect. Many studies, empirical studies, have shown this holds for individuals, it holds for institutions, and this is one of the reasons why you see here this high concentration, and if I <clears throat> enlarge, you see here this 88% 80, 80, 80 of ESC grants in the top 10 countries. If I make it a bit wider and include Finland, because I don't think Finland should be excluded here, you would say it's 90% in 11 top countries, and then there is the rest. And of course, there are factors behind it. There are, these are countries that have a higher investment in R&D, part the, the percentage of their uh, GDP. We made a, a correlation. Uh, countries, particularly those in Eastern Europe, that invest less than 1% of their GDP practically stand no chance here because the basic infrastructure is not there. And those, and there are always talented people, those who get it move to another country. And it has taken the ERC 10 years for every new member state of the European Union to have at least one ERC grant. So this is one of the constraints of a structural kind that we have, despite our strong belief and our strong practice in finding talented people everywhere and going through the kind of selection procedure that the ERC stands for in finding and funding excellent people and excellent ideas. Now, let me turn to another case, and I will not go into the details. Most of you have heard about CRISPR, the new gene editing uh, tool that has, <clears throat> it has a long uh, history as uh, many things in, in, in science. And one of the <clears throat> papers that 
uh, recounts this history was by Eric Lander, The Heroes of CRISPR, so he shows how many people and places were involved in it. But he was later accused in what became a very fierce patent battle that is still ongoing where the patents should actually go to. So here you have a wonderful new method that is really revolutionizing the way how the life sciences are being done. It will allow us to select uh, not just to eliminate some genes that are known uh, to uh, cause illnesses, we will be able to add new genes that nature has not provided us to add. So it opens up a completely new field. It is open, people can use it, and yet these are three of the protagonists of the ongoing um, patent battle behind the scenes. Teams of lawyers are involved on everyone's side, and I think uh, this year's uh, Nobel Prize was an elegant way of sidestepping, an elegant way of sidestepping. Uh, CRISPR will get a Nobel Prize in the future, but they did not want to step into the hot water today. So what is not being said, um, it's not so much EPR battles. We know uh, intellectual property right is important. It helps to move science on. At the same time, it also prevents some of the science to move on. And again, there have been studies that show that, at least in the life sciences, if you have a patent too early, in the way, in this long journey from having made a new discovery to actually moving on to something that is on the market, which takes 15 to 20 years. Uh, if you patent too early, it's a signal, like in biology, you know, a signal of this is my territory. Don't even try to move because you will not succeed. And then people turn to other areas. So it also has a hindering effect on innovation. But you have to be careful. This is not a generalization. You have to look at case by case by case. So we know about intellectual property rights. But um, there are other things that are not being said when we propagate openness as being a win-win situation for all. And recently, two colleagues from the field of ST, STS, Science Technology Studies, which is my professional background, have done a study, again, in the life sciences to show how heterogeneous the situations are and that one size of openness does not fit all. They have looked at um, a community of life scientists asking what is the situation concerning data banks, what is the situation concerning software, what is the situation in exchanging biomaterial, which is very important, this sort of almost um, ritualistic gift-giving um, way of exchanging biomaterials from lab to lab. And uh, their names are Levin and, and Leonelli, and they came up with uh, showing a much more diverse picture. It depends, for instance, where are you in your scientific career. If you are a young researcher, and if you know your next promotion, whatever it is, will depend on having a paper published, hopefully in a high-impact journal, that shows how original your work are. Are you really willing to give away your most original work so far and let others reuse it? And will it not hamper your chances of proving, of having the evidence that you will be able to do original work in the future? These are questions for young researchers that make us more cautious. Openness is one size that does not fit all. If you're in an established position, the situation is different. It depends on the context. If you work in the software development, which is becoming more and more important in the life sciences, uh, people are very clever. They, let, uh, they use a code that can be used by others, 
but it cannot be reused under certain circumstances. So you build in your own way of opening up at the same time to don't, you don't let everyone use everything and so on. And at the, at the end, of course, you have to um, acknowledge what binds science together. It's trust and it's both cooperation and competition. And whatever a policymaker wants us to be open, unless you take into account the specific situation of the specific scientific community, where people are, what the context is, um, you will fail unless you really take this into account. But overall, <clears throat> people realize, and this also comes out from this study, people realize that, uh, of course, sharing is important. Without sharing, without the norm of reciprocity, you give, and uh, if you don't give, nobody is going to give anything back to you. You will not achieve anything. But um, trust is a very precious uh, good that needs to be um, maintained and, and, and retained. A third <coughs> constraint um, is that the openness for citizens. And I don't know, I presume Dominique Pester yesterday has spoken also about uh, citizen science. No? Ah, he was not here. So, um, so he would have spoken about it if he had been here. And um, <coughs> my take on it, I will be rather, uh, rather brief on, on this. My take on it, it's, it's an old story. As you can see <coughs> from these um, uh, journals, that there's a history, call it amateur science, that goes back to the origins of modern science. Modern science was built by <coughs> you know, a, um, an, an elite, <coughs> but very much with the help and supported by amateurs who were fascinated by this new modern opening towards the natural world and what we could now discover. And <clears throat> as I said, there's a long history and in the 19th century in particular, um, <clears throat> there was a lot of what we would now call citizen science. But <clears throat> what exactly is it? <clears throat> and here we come across uh, a wide range <coughs> of phenomena, and we have very little empirical data. We don't really know <coughs> who are the people who are participating uh, in open science, in, in citizen science. We have glimpses, you know, there are the bird watchers, <coughs> there are am amateurs uh, still from the 19th century or from Linnaeus' time that <coughs> are very much engaged in observing the environment, and you can tap into that. They are the computer nerds, and uh, some spectacular citizen science has been done uh, regarding the um, astronomy. Astronomy always had a wonderful community of fans, of amateurs, who were even traveling to see um, phenomena that were capturing their imagination. And uh, Galaxy Zoo is one of the famous examples how citizen science progressed in that field. The protein folding community, again with people who are uh, using their own laptop to participate in, it's yet another community. But overall, we don't have a clear picture who are these people, how long do they stay, what is their motivation. And <clears throat> So we can only say um, it poses some major challenges if we want to keep this openness and including society in a participatory way, also in the way how research is being done. And I think uh, this is very, very important. We have heard so much and the scientific community has really woken up to the necessity of communicating more and better with society. But very often we do it by only showing the wonderful products that we can deliver. It's the glorious outcome that we like to communicate. And François Jacob, the Nobel laureate, once spoke about day science and night science. And what he meant was, you know, the life of a scientist, think of it as a 24-hour cycle. Sometimes you get some sleep, but if you are in the midst of an exciting experiment, you won't get very much. But there's day science and night science. Day science means 
your work has come up with some wonderful results that you are eager to share with the world. And the night science is something that is hidden behind it. It's the frustration that you have if an experiment does not work, or you have to throw out your data, you have to start from scratch again, you are frustrated, you are persistent, otherwise you would never reach the day science. And I feel that we are communicating, we as the scientific community, we are communicating far too much on the day science and too little on the night side. Because it's part of how science is done. And once you get into this night science, you can also communicate better what the process of science actually amounts to. So <clears throat> this um, raises, of course, the question participation. We have moved from being an amateur towards we want people to participate in the research process even, and we want to empower them as actors, as some kind of colleague that form part of the process. But this raises a number of challenges. What are the actual expectations? How can you keep your citizen scientists um, on board? You have to clarify the objectives. You have to introduce a kind of quality control. You have to see that data collection, which is what much of citizen science consists of, data collection is done in a methodologically uh, solid, robust way. You have to have not just quality control, but also some standardization and so on. And uh, you have to pay people not with money, but with respect. You have to treat them as lay people who at one point are able to exchange and come in with their expertise as well and not just be looked upon or feel exploited. So what I want to say here is if we want to move on in this field, I think it's time to think about some kind of European charter for citizen science that clarifies the objectives, the way how it's being done, uh, etc. Otherwise, um, it remains a constraint in this kind of openness. And this is just a cartoon that shows, um, it was a hashtag, I'm a research parasite, by, by sharing and not sharing. So there is this ambivalence in feeling, what do we share, what do we not share, what is open, what is not open. Let me now <clears throat> move on to um, the way how science has changed over its history. Peter started already with the five stages that he sees in research infrastructures, starting from the uh, ancient libraries or the medieval um, libraries that were also very important to the latest cloud. And <clears throat> here, the major shifts we have seen, we, I don't want to go back to the origins of uh, modern science in the 17th century, but uh, what happened in the 19th century essentially is the institutionalization of universities. We had in the middle of the 19th century, the very decisive move of some of the best basic research that was being done in German universities, in particular at that time, to industry, setting up industrial labs, doing more or less the same science, but within the framework of an industry, and of course being tied to industrial uh, goals. And in the 20th century, this was the century essentially of big science, also of the military industrial complex. And now we are clearly moving into a new phase. We can perhaps be in a, in a transition, but the transition is speeding up very quickly. <clears throat> and we are moving to uh, a situation where <clears throat> much more will be data driven, deep learning and machine learning will come also to the way how science is being done if it's not already there. Things will be automated that took a long time before 
and this goes at a very rapid uh, pace. And it also means um, the extension of the geographic reach, where science is being done, how it is being done. It is uh, reaching the global stage. It is much more collaborative than in the past. We see this, by the way, also in the publication patterns. People have looked at the rise of uh, multi-authored papers. They can also, and this is perhaps the, the, the good news about it, they can also show that if your multi-authored papers come from different parts of the world, your um, citation impact is likely to be higher. So there is something to be said for this international collaboration that also shows up in your impact factors afterwards. But above all, it's the use of data digitalization that come with um, the deeply embedded algorithms and the fantastic computational ability that has been reached by now. And this poses a number of new questions that we have hardly tackled uh, right on. One of these, of course, is also the question to academia. What are we training our people for? <clears throat> this is one of the graphs that come out of a study <clears throat> in which I was also, a, it, it was a report done by the Royal Society in, in London, looking, uh, dated um, 2010, but I don't think the picture has changed very much since, looking at what happens in the STEM disciplines, PhDs in the STEM disciplines, and what are the transition points in scientific careers once people have their PhD. And what you see is a very high percentage after their PhD, moving right out to other sectors. Then you see on the bottom line, those who remain first, um, the early career researchers, then they continue, but after some time, they start to move back and out of science. And at the end, and this is a figure that I always uh, like to show this slide also to my students, and I wish that more teachers at university would do this. Don't think you will end up standing here instead of me as a full professor. Don't think that, because the likelihood is very small. What you see ending up here is 0 0.45, ending up as full professors. Now, this is not to say, forget your illusions. It's just to make you realistic and to say there are all these wonderful opportunities outside of science. Society is open for the best trained people. And I, as a university teacher, want to give you all the skills, the knowledge I have to empower you to use this knowledge in society for the best uh, of everyone. But <clears throat> let's take a look at these uh, people at the bottom of this uh, graph here, those who remain after their uh, PhD, whatever will be their future fate, we don't uh, really know. But, um, yeah, and this is <clears throat> the, let's think uh, just a few minutes, what is the impact of this changing environment? Let's focus on them. And uh, I think everyone of my generation agrees, the younger generation now are under much heavier pressure than the previous generations. They are asked to do multitasking, do your good science, communicate, become an entrepreneur, do this, do that, uh, network. It is more and more and more that is being heaped on them. At the same time, the funding system, as we all know, has changed uh, dramatically. We have what some of us call move towards projectification. Funding proceeds largely through project fundings. From time to time, research infrastructures cannot do with projects alone. They need, what we heard, strategic funding. But for many uh, young scientists in particular, they depend on project funding, and it means thinking already what you are going to apply for while you are still in the middle <clears throat> of your, your project. And there is an enormous um, time pressure. People very often think it's 
acceleration, everything speeds up. But if we take a closer look, and my colleague in Vienna, Ulrike Feld, has uh, done this in, in, in a very nice way, what actually happens is that you see a clash of time regimes. There are institutions are time generators. They set the pace, they set the time. Funding agencies tell you if you are under 35, this um, funding line is open to you. If you are under 30, this funding line is... So there are all these temporal limits and time regimes. And very often there are clashes and no one to synchronize these clashes. If you do uh, an experiment, the outcome, the timing of the outcome does not necessarily uh, coincide with your next uh, paper or the promotion where you need to show the outcome of the experiment. So what you do, you're left hanging in this limbo. There's the time pressure <coughs> of coming up uh, with publications in high impact journals, etc., etc. And then there's, of course, also the ambivalence and being torn do I want to move out when? Do I want to become an entrepreneur when? And do I have the skills and realistically the possibilities uh, to do so? The impact <coughs> on institutions, these are just some of the, uh, the, the questions here. We would have to go into much more detail. Um, <coughs> data infrastructures, um, <coughs> sorry for the misspelling here. Um, I would like to see them become something like knowledge aggregators. Information does not equal knowledge. Information, in the sense of data, um, <clears throat> does not meet knowledge. And can we do something really to uh, to be better in aggregating um, the the data so that <clears throat> they are useful, used, reused? for purposes that we do not know as yet when we collect them and when we process them. Then there's the question <coughs> of authorship, attribution of authorships. Many people are aware of this. And uh, ownership, the asymmetries um, that I alluded to, and the ambivalence of sharing. So this is not to say that openness <coughs> does not um, uh, it's not a good thing. This is not to say that openness does not bring enormous benefits to society, to institutions, to individuals, that science depends, has always depended on openness and sharing. But it's just to make you aware that if we start to unpack this notion, we have to realize that there are some structural constraints and there is some ambivalence that has to be met in the context and that one size does not fit all. How many more minutes do I have? One? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Then um, <clears throat> I, I recently spoke in Budapest, as Peter said already, about the resilience of science. And the resilience of science is very important these days when we hear so much and are confronted with alternative facts, when experts are being denigrated, um, and when in some parts of this world at least, science is um, being pushed uh, to, to, to the side. And in these conditions, I think it is very important to remind ourselves of the strengths of science, of resilience of science. And just to raise you through in my last two minutes, the first, and this is a very strong point, science works. How do we know it works? We see the outcome and we have set up ways of getting it right. And we also have peer review with all the flaws it has, but there is nothing better as yet. This is just my view of peer review and the flaws. But then <clears throat> there is a, and this is the second strength of the resilience, um, we, we have a very strong and shared belief in what Abram Flexner in 1939 called the, useless, the usefulness of useless knowledge. And what he meant is basic research, let people do what they are good at, give them the autonomy, 
Later, this led to setting up the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton that became home of some of the um, people who had to flee Europe in the dark uh, years of the rise of fascism and uh, Nazism, totalitarianism. And I think <clears throat> this has been reprinted now, thanks to Robert Dijkgraaf at, at, at Princeton. It's worth reading. But I would like to link it with an appeal to start to rethink usefulness as well. We know there is a long transition from a seemingly useless idea and seemingly useless uh, to becoming useful. We know far too little how this process actually works. Translation, what you attempt to do through this, is one tap into it. The same holds for innovation. We know far too little how the actual process works. But then there are questions like, what is useful? Who defines it and useful for whom? And <clears throat> my last slide, my last message to you, the resilience of science is very much linked to the way how science deals with uncertainty. And science being able and being attracted and being passionate about moving towards the unknown has a very good way of dealing with uncertainty. And it's the thriving even at the cusp of uncertainty. While if we look at society, we see a craving for certainty. We see a kind of shrinking back from the uncertain. And once you fear the future, you eliminate so many options because you have only one way to retreat, and this is backwards. And I have said more about this in my book, The Cunning of Uncertainty, but I strongly believe this is one of the ways how science brings the future into the present and how it keeps its being radically open. Thank you very much and very much. <laughs> It's so exciting, this, this uh, with uncertainty, and uh, there are, uh, since, I mean, since science is this kind of successive knowledge digging process, the latest knowledge will always be a bit uncertain, wouldn't it? So, so mm -hmm. it's also hard to communicate this to, towards... Yes, but this is why it is so important to communicate much better the way how science is being the process, done, yes. the process of exactly. doing science. And then you see, um, of course, all scientists want uh, to communicate to each other mm. knowledge about which mm. they are certain. Mm. But at the same time, we all know whatever we know now is preliminary mm. knowledge mm. because there will be mm. new knowledge mm. superseding, mm. confirming, enlarging, mm. Whatever. So there is this uh, way of moving with the process, mm. moving into the uncertain future, but instead of being a threat, it becomes something mm. that is exciting. Exactly. And I think this mm. is something that needs to be communicated much mm. more, much mm. better to mm. the public. And mm. um, the public and also politicians, they always want to get very clear answers, yes or no. Mm. And then they ask these uh, impossible questions. Um, mm. Is this substance cancerous, yes yeah. or, or mm. no? And the most sincere answer scientists usually can give is yes under the conditions mm. of, and then comes mm. a long list, mm. or no under the conditions mm. of. And politicians very often don't want to hear mm. this. They, they just really want to it. have yes mm. or no, black or white. Or well, they go to and another researcher. And, and, and none <laughs> of the, none of the caveats. <laughs> no. So again, you know, I there know. is a, there, there's a range. There's mm. not one data point. There is a range, mm. and this also has to mm. be communicated. Uh, I, I was actually involved in a project uh, last year with the Royal Dramatic Theatre in Stockholm. We, we, we discovered the dark side, the, the <laughs> night side of the... the, of I, the I, night is better than dark. Of course. <laughs> I, I don't know why I said dark. The nights are dark, but well, we but, also but need I, the nights. You know. I know, and that was so... I mean, we actually... We, we didn't put the scientists on stage, but we asked authors, drama authors, to interview mm -hmm. a certain mm -hmm. um, a group of sci uh, scientists, and then they told their stories by... Actually, um, uh, uh, they were 
people on stage doing this. But the the key I just wanted to make here, because mm. it uh, touches what you just said, the audience was so fascinated to become sort of invited to what is, mm -hmm. what does actually this researcher, what keeps him awake at night? What is it really that interests him or her? And and what is the, the, the key to to, uh, to being a scientist instead of just producing mm -hmm. results? So I think that was one way of communicating mm -hmm. a very complicated matter. But now it's your turn, please, Ursula. Can you use the mic? I, <laughs> I'm sorry, you don't I, need it, but it's for I, the... I fully agree with you because I actually think I try to communicate to the young generation, you know, we can't discover the US anymore, but with science, we are the explorers into the unknown. Mm -hmm. And I think that really gets a lot of people excited who were turned off by doing factual studies for learning facts by heart forever and ever in school, mm -hmm. where we're, you know, we're doing a lot of things good, but we're also not doing good in science mm -hmm. education. And that's another part where we need to, to get things going that this, because we need to get these explorer types. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we lose them very early in the process because mm. they don't understand that that is mm. the, f uh, the character mm. at mm. the end. That well, mm. part of the uh, motivation, especially with children, of course, is cu curiosity. Mm. And we are born to be curious, otherwise, mm. you know, our uh, evolution would not have uh, been able to equip mm. us uh, with the necessary cognitive but also physical abilities to explore the world around us mm. and yet at the same time we all know something happens to children and their curiosity once they go to school mm. they are very eager to enter school and then after one year mm. you see the same child and you ask how is it mm. and you know <laughs> you know the answer mm. <laughs> so something happens there that i think we also need to address how can we keep this spirit of curiosity mm. and curiosity leads you to you don't know where it will lead you to i mean you know a general direction mm. um, <clears throat> sometimes people mm. also use the persistence and the patience then they, they switch too much mm. but still you know to to uh, turn this curiosity into something that then becomes a kind of explorer's mm. strategy uh, with with a focus and with a direction i think this is part of um, what you are saying mm. uh, also so, so <coughs> with this curiosity and with this fantastic ability of, of science, how come that we, we can now feel that science is sort of questions and uh, questioned or, or perhaps even under attack? I don't know if you agree with <coughs> me, but uh, I, and, I, and I how can then the openness the <laughs> become, become a, a problem here? So I, I fully agree with the mm. with the diagnosis. I mean, what what we are seeing is it's <clears throat> mm. it's frightening, and this is also why the march on for, for, for it was the march mm. for science yes. um, that happened last. Um, uh, last yeah, we talked in, about in, it in yesterday. March, in, yeah. in March, yeah, mm. uh, was a strong signal mm. on the part of the scientific mm. community, and it was one of the responses. Yeah. But I would say one march is not enough. No. Uh, rather, we should prepare for a marathon. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. get Are our you prepared? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> metaphorically, of course. that's what we should yes. be prepared for. It will be a, a, a marathon. Why is it happening? Well, partly it's the, <coughs> the political scenery. Science is being... Science is seen by many people as part of the elites mm. that they are voting against, that they mm -hmm. feel neglected by. Mm. And we are part of the elite. Mm. There is no way of saying, you know, it has nothing to do with us. Mm. But our responsibility is a different one mm. from other parts of mm. the elite by saying, um, look, the way forward is this radical openness mm -hmm. of science in the sense that whatever the future will bring, 
it will be largely shaped by scientific technological developments mm -hmm. and the way how society takes them up and what mm -hmm. society does mm -hmm. with them. The, the potential is enormous. It happens very rapidly, but it will depend. And if people just turn their backs and say, well, all this is uh, threatening, uh, etc. I, I, as, as I said before, you know, once you are afraid, you are closing your options towards mm -hmm. the future. Mm -hmm. And to keep this spirit of the future alive and mm. to convey this excitement also, you know, you want to find out what you don't know as yet. You want to move into the territory but of, since the, we are of the now, unknown. Uh, since we are now also mm. discussing the, last, the large facilities and, and the infrastructures, uh, the, the bigger they get, the yeah. more <coughs> money that goes in there. What, <coughs> what happens to, to, to this uh, sort of mutual <laughs> well <laughs> look uh, very people, short uh, peop I'm people sorry, are are fascinated yeah. also by big questions course, and yes. big infrastructures yeah, yeah. cern has done a great mm, job mm. you know in know. making but one secret mm. or not mm. uh, not uh, it's an open secret what cern has done early on yeah. was to set up a program of inviting practically all physics teachers of Europe mm. to teach them the mm. physics that mm. they no longer know. Mm. It was so new for, for the teachers, so they yeah, needed I to I mean, they there. had been yeah. trained yeah, in, in yeah. physics. Yeah. They yeah. were not yeah. um, also not confident. I mean, they knew what was happening. They were so generous happening. all the time. The <coughs> and so CERN did True. this. And uh, maybe, you mm. know, in other infrastructures, mm. um, if you were able to involve <coughs> the teachers and to share with the teachers what is happening mm. there. Then you can have an uh, effect that goes into schools and then also the students have the feeling, well, we can relate to these infrastructures. So what we saw <coughs> before, you That's know, the, the, the Science Life Lab, yes, yes. people say, well, you know, <coughs> genetics, mm. for either mm. I want nothing mm. to do with mm. it or they will only tell me what that I will get Alzheimer's and mm. I don't want mm. to know, uh, you know, these kind of reactions. But once you tell them <coughs> also what are the uncertainties, mm. how to think with probabilities. Exactly. When uh, Matthias Uhlen said, uh, when I asked mm. him about, you know, what is the mm. outcome of, of the cancer atlas, he rightly said, we learned a lot, mm. as I expected, mm. about the average patient. But the patient before mm. you, you can never say with certainty, oh you will get this cancer mm. or not. Mm. And therefore, doctors, but also everyone working with teachers or in such an infrastructure or as communicator, we have also to convey life is full of probabilities. Mm. It is. It makes yeah, it complicated, um, but wonderful. No, uh, I, uh, yes, I, yes. I wonder now, <laughs> since we have a few um, facilities, I mean, we have Matthias here. Mm -hmm. do, did, did you invite teachers to your, to your facility? Have you a program for, for teachers in school? Otherwise, it's a good idea. <laughs> yes. You don't, you and, don't and, have to and, answer. And what about you back there? Do you have a program for school teachers? Yeah. Max Freud does that in collaboration with various institutions here in Lund, Wattenhallen, and the uh, Resource Center for Physics Education, I think it's called. And we have this uh, great vision of having a school lab where we take in uh, children and yeah. actually expose them to a scientific experiment. That would be our dream. That's My true dream. open science, isn't it? And, and what about Slack? Do you have teachers' programs? Not yet. <laughs> okay, so, so, but, but, but may, may I just, in that case, convey an, a piece mm. of advice, because I've been involved in such projects, and I know also, in, at least in Sweden, it's very important to not forget the heads of the schools. If, uh -huh. So if you, if you actually invite the mm. teachers, if they come back to the schools, they're full of enthusiasm. Oh, no, I want to big a new chemistry lab, and what do do do? And you know, should director. you do this? <laughs> And the colleagues, mm. not. And what about money? So do invite and give them a medal. We, we mm. always did mm. that at the Academy of Sciences. We gave, we gave the teachers and the heads of the schools medals. Do you remember, Matthias? <laughs> it was the Inva Lindqvist Prize. It was the most brilliant, very easy, but brilliant way of so doing but it. Now we have one mm. more question. Sorry. It, it just I get so excited. Uh, this is my favorite topic. <laughs> 
you know, it, to get it, the new generation in, you know. Yeah. No, uh, the, the principal point behind it uh, is that uh, science, in order to prepare for this marathon, we need more allies. Of course. We need more alignment with other forces in society. Bottom up, yeah. And yeah. the teachers yeah. are, of course, one important yes. group. The young generation, the students, the children are another, yeah. but then there are many other factors. Then it of becomes course, unstoppable will impact in them. a way. But can, can preparing I have two for more the maritime, minutes? more allies. Yeah, yeah. So, so sorry. please, yes. Yeah, thank you for a really interesting talk. Uh, I was reflecting while you were showing some of the uh, histograms that you had there about uh, the fact that here we are in Sweden and we are celebrating the 350th anniversary of a Swedish university and we are conducting the meeting in English. And yesterday we had a comment about the ETH being the best university in Europe. And yes. it is the best non-English speaking university in Europe. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, just a minute, <laughs> and when you look at, when you look at, for example, the Singapore Index or the Times uh, uh, listing of universities in the world, and you look at the top 25, 23 of them are English speaking. Mm. And mm -hmm. the ones that are not are the ETH in Zurich and Singapore University. And if you go to the top 100, you'll find that 60 mm -hmm. of the top 100 are English speaking. Now then, mm -hmm. uh, this is a kind of back to your Matthew principle, to those who have shall be given. What's your views on this about the way that English has taken over? During my career, it's changed enormously. I, used to, I had to do examinations in French and German at university. Uh, and when I look at this listing, I can't believe that my home university is so much better, mm. apparently, according to this listing, uh, to Uppsala University or Lund University. So mm. I have this feeling there's a bias. Mm. I'd like to mm. hear your view. Mm. Well, um, <clears throat> this opens, first of all, the question about rankings, and we can discuss one hour about rankings. They all have their flaws, they all have their biases, we know why they have been set up, why there are new ones, etc. Et um, nevertheless, as long as rankings are taken seriously, especially by the rectors and presidents of those who are high in the rankings, uh, and by <laughs> politicians who are then... Uh, <clears throat> Taking advantage. Yeah. Well, the, the politicians like to mm. give, again, mm. the Matthew principle in action mm. to those that are already mm. good, strengthen mm. the strength. But uh, behind uh, this, this phenomena, I, I think we have to realize in the 19th century, the language of science was largely German followed mm. by French. Mm. And um, <clears throat> I mean, also physics was German, mm. French speaking, mm. and whoever else was English speaking knew enough German to mm. communicate um, in, uh, in, in, in German or in, or in French. What happened was um, the decisive shift after 45, and the scientific world weight shifted to the, to the US. The US, um, as the university system is it's, it's well known, it has many more private universities that has a, have a different um, governance, allows them to do things that state universities in Europe cannot do. But above all, they also have large endowments. And if you look at, and I recently saw an interesting uh, study on, you know, what, uh, how much can money buy is, is the real question. And the answer is, with an endowment, if that is large enough, it can buy quite a lot. And you need, of course, um, the right kind of selection principles, So, but you can really get the world's best people to come there already as undergraduates, uh, because you mentioned ETH Zurich. I spent eight years at ETH Zurich. And for instance, what ETH Zurich does, uh, it selects, there, there is a cap uh, of how many people from outside you can take uh, because the Swiss should have some uh, priority. 
but uh, what ETH does is to uh, look at its, um, so uh, undergraduates is, is, is largely Swiss, master students you have 40% uh, coming from outside, and then ETH hand picks the master students and they invite them to stay on for a PhD, which is a clever strategy. Mm -hmm. And something similar happens in the US already with the undergraduate, you know, if, if you look at the figures, it's full of undergraduates who want to get uh, a degree. And then, you know, the, the, the system starts to select mm. the best undergraduates to stay for master, to stay for PhD, etc. And the exciting places, and this has always been the case, are those where you have this enormous density of interaction. You have the facilities, you have the research infrastructures, but you have some of the best people in the same corridor mm. or over coffee mm. you can talk to from different mm. disciplinary backgrounds. The age mm. does not matter. Junior faculty is treated uh, on an equal way. It matters what you say and not how old you are. And the language and, itself. And it's, it's this <coughs> density. And uh, Europe is catching up, mm. but it's, uh, we are still slow because also our structure is different. Mm. And in terms of the sheer um, concentration of endowment funds, this is really staggering what you can do with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah. Can we <coughs> two more minutes? So short there, and then a comment from Ursula. Well, Thank you. Actually, the funding agencies as well must bear some responsibility here because your graph shows this. For example, the ERC uh, funds proportionately more uh, from the UK than from any of the other places that you showed. So it's not simply a question of the rectors of the top-ranking universities. Who are, to, uh, who are responsible here. Mm. But the other point I'd like mm. to make is that I have sat as director of large infrastructures at council meetings. And what is so striking is that the uh, contributions and the decision-making that follows those contributions is basically those people who can speak English well. Mm. Whereas those who are sitting around the table who cannot speak English well do not contribute in the same way. And for me, this has got to be changed. Yeah. Well, uh, it, Thank it, you it, for it, pointing it, that out. I think we always feel yeah, like this I, when I, we I don't just, have just, the mother tongue, don't just we? Just one sentence mm. to the UK success uh, with the ERC. If you look at the figures and if you take from this uh, large... Um, wait, uh, maybe I, I, can, I can find it quickly. Um, bum, 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 bum. Here we are. If you look at the UK, way up, mm. here it does not show it, but if you take away the non-UK-born ESC grants, mm -hmm. it's about the same as uh, Germany and France, or even less. Mm -hmm. And this means mm. the UK has been able to attract talent from abroad, by whatever mm. means. And this is the real message, mm. internationalize, mm. internationalize, be open in this sense and take the best people and retain them. The same is true for the Netherlands. Ursula, please. As a non-English <laughs> native <laughs> speaker, yeah. I awesome. want, and my play YA is strongly for English. Mm. I'm very excited that ETH moved into mandatory English teaching at <coughs> master level, everybody, even if you're not native speaking. <coughs> I actually think yeah, the key is we can communicate and the earlier we communicate to everybody, learn English, because if you want to interact with the world, the sooner the better. As the key is that we have a language to communicate. And as a woman, <coughs> I'm really glad it's not German because English <coughs> is a rather gender <laughs> neutral language, yeah. right? It's, the, it's not a chairman, it's the chair. It's and not you know a fireman, it's the firefighter. And in German, you know, we have to then I know, the no, female, no. male version, and it's become And so you know what the Chinese have learned us, that we speak so much with, your, with our body and so little with our mouth. So we can actually <laughs> communicate so much better than we believe. And sooner or later, since we are talking about um, innovation, 
innovation here. here. I'm sure that, that uh, Siri or Watson or whatever they are called will solve this soon. We have a little gadget behind our ear and we can talk any, any language on this planet or whatever. <laughs> so by saying that, I think I have to conclude this very interesting discussion or discussions. And thank you so very much for contributing and with your openness, Helga Novotny. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. And this is a medal for you. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So, for Lund University, thank 350 and, years. And, a wonderful and to be prepared. Prepared, be prepared. Yes, for the marathon. For a marathon. <laughs> I think the science marathon is something we should really work on. So, please, people, uh, sit for another um, short session. This will be the summer session now. And... Um, Please uh, welcome uh, on stage the, the hosts <coughs> for this uh, fantastic seminar. We are glad to see you both here. Professor uh, of Research Policy yep. at Lund University, Mats Benner. And this is so beautiful, so I must get it right <laughs> now. But I haven't got the right paper in front of me. So, Professor of I the Ideas... History of Ideas. Histories of Ideas and Sciences. To me, that is the combination of the most beautiful words in, in the English language. Right. <laughs> Sometimes so I li like, I wish it was, you know. <laughs> so please, summarize for us now. Thank what have we been through? Thank you very much, Eva, and thank you. We will be short. We know that time is flying, the sun is rising, yes. uh, and stomach is getting empty. Uh, we would like to take the opportunity, first of all, to thank the speakers, Helga, Botnik, Peter Tindemans, Ishan Kao, Ursula Keller, Björn Nilsson is uh, elapsed, Matthias Ulen, of course, and the audience for being such an interactive audience. When we started planning this uh, symposium, um, we had in mind actually the metaphor that Helga brought up of daytime versus nighttime science. There was a lot of daytime science that called for attention when this university was planning its anniversary. And we suggested that even though it may be a bit dour to have something on infrastructures rather than, let's say, the wonderful promises of this or that, uh, it's part of uh, a sign of a mature university that it can actually do some soul searching. Uh, and this university in particular, which along the lines of the old blues song, woke up this morning and had the infrastructure blues. <laughs> uh, uh, when suddenly all the achievements of an Ingolf Lindau, or for that matter, Matthias Ullén in Stockholm and others, propelling uh, in their own uh, sort of quarters, infrastructure developments suddenly ending up with two major infrastructures actually here in Lund, uh, but also several, as we've learned throughout these days, infrastructures propping up, cropping up, uh, which inevitably confronts the university with the uncertainties that you so elegantly uh, outlined. So we figured that it would be a nice gesture of the university to actually celebrate uncertainty. We've celebrated lots of certainty during <laughs> this year, uh, which is good for the general public, I think, at least partly, to, uh, as a lullaby, uh, but I think it's also for the uh, sleepless nights of scientists and university managers and uh, illuminated citizens to actually have this little attention to the, to the not the monster that we've sort of uh, unraveled, but the, the tensions and the, and the process that, that we've sort of uh, incepted via these infrastructures. So that was the very reason why you're here today. And we're very happy that you obliged and came and listened. And now Thomas Kaiserfeld will make a snappy <laughs> summary of two days of deliberations on these matters. Thank you so much, Mats, for that. Yes, I was just <coughs> thinking about what has been said of these two days. And I, I have observed, me myself at least, three main themes. I don't know if you agree, we'll see. Uh, but uh, I think you can follow the program to some extent and see then that one major theme was, of course, infrastructures. And I think what was important there was the concept of heterogeneous um, funding landscape. Some were complaining about that, there was some whining of that, uh, that it is so hard to time the funding of these infrastructures. They're so expensive, you need to... Uh, 
get resources together. Um, but I thought about that, and I think perhaps that's actually pretty good, because it demands long-term thinking and organization by those who want an infrastructure in place. And the reason then for this is being good is that one infrastructure is usually very expensive, and once it, once it is in place, it amasses a material structure, and then it is very hard to kind of divest, to deconstruct, as it were, and then, in order to operate it for extensive periods of time, there needs to be some sign of long-term commitment already on the funding stage. So I actually think it may be a good thing, not only a bad thing, that it is necessary to time a commitment like an infrastructure already on the funding, uh, funding stage. So, um, if you continue then, of course, we had the whole session on innovation, and many times social innovation was highlighted in that session. And I think absolutely that is something that is uh, talked a lot about, not the least in the preliminaries to the ninth framework program. Uh, there are quite a lot of forces trying to broaden the innovation concept. Uh, and we heard today also about infrastructures that one of the main problems, of course, in running infrastructures is how to organize them in an efficient way, usually also involving universities, as Matthias Elian mentioned, several universities occasionally, uh, making it possible to cooperate also between universities and infrastructures in an efficient way. And that is, of course, a challenge that may demand, to some extent, social innovation. What we usually forget when we talk about innovation, and perhaps especially social innovation, is not only that innovation is for markets or for beneficiaries outside of the universities. Innovation is, in my mind, just as much for us researchers, the way for us to identify and work on relevant problems. So, that it would certainly be, be a problem uh, relevant for social innovation. How to organize large structures, uh, not only infrastructure perhaps, in inefficient ways. And that brings me to the third theme, the university. Uh, big structure, perhaps infrastructure, an organization at universities. Uh, I mean, we celebrate now 350 years of Lund University. But is it really one Lund University? One sometimes wonder. Aren't there quite a few faculties of Lund universities that work more or less independently of each other? And what we have in common is actually, perhaps more than anything else, a management group, a vice chancellor, and a administration. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of efforts trying to bring faculties together. There is the Puffendorf Institution, but of course much too small uh, to do any real work that goes through all of the university. So I think that is really a challenge for the university in the future, and especially when we have these large infrastructures in place, to get the faculties and the infrastructures to address problems and social innovation, I guess. Was that... Three minutes? Four, perhaps. Three minutes. So, thank you. <laughs> we'll just stop. That was exactly what I was going to do. <laughs> I was just going to thank you all and thank uh, Thomas and Mats for all your efforts. I think it's, you're worth uh, a medal each as well for, for this. Um, <laughs> I have plenty of them here. Because oh. without your work... Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. You've not been here today. Wonderful. Thank you all for coming, sharing, and uh, go out in the sun.